The Yappy Chatterbox Podcast presents The Extraordinary Ordinary Interview with Dana Allen. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to my interview with Dana Allen. Dana is a painter and friend who has been creating art for over 20 years. It's this 20 plus years of making art that has made Dana one of the most well-known and respected female artists today. Not only is her work amazing, but it's her approach to painting is what makes her so extraordinary. Thanks so much for listening and enjoy the episode. Hi, Dana. Welcome to the Extraordinary Ordinary Podcast. Thanks. Welcome to our studio. Yes, it's been a pleasure. So um, I met you through your husband, Matt, um, and... When I had spoken to Matt, when I came to visit you at your studio a couple of months ago, uh, I, that's when I actually met you. Um, come to find out you're an artist yourself. Yes, I am. So to me, I got, it was a double whammy because it was so amazing. Because so for me, I would say within the last 20 years, I have become uh, a more appreciative of art and just art artists, how the process works and sort of something like that. Um, so to be able to talk to, to an artist face to face <laughs> is something that I literally had to splash water in my face about five times this morning to think that oh I wasn't goodness. dreaming because <laughs> Just little old us. I know, but it's, it's more than that because to be able to talk to a person who has dedicated their life to art, um, is just fascinating and, and extraordinary. So um, I'm hopefully today I can just ask you every single question that I have about artists and art and how you and sort of how you began and and where you are now. So um, if you'll do me the pleasure, I would love to sort of figure out or just sort of discover how you as an artist do you. It's excellent. It's it's amazing to have someone want to know, you know, what makes me tick and how we work. So it's, thanks for your interest in. Oh, I having can't having this conversation. I can't tell you how happy I am. Aww. This is going to be so much fun. So please say more. <laughs> so before we even get started uh, with sort of your process, let's sort of take it back. So um, where are you originally from, Dana? Uh, I was born in Brooklyn. Okay. In 1971. Oh, okay. A long time ago. Uh, all the details. So Brooklyn for the first year of my life, Staten Island till I was seven, Staten Island, New York, and then spent my formative years, I'd say my favorite childhood years in Westbrook, Connecticut, which is a little tiny town on the shoreline, um, like two hours outside New York. Okay. And lived there until I was 16 and then was uprooted, we'll say. Uh, my parents aren't going to listen to this, so it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> uprooted, yanked out of my idyllic home of Westbrook, Connecticut and moved to Florida. Well, talk about pardon, a dichotomy pardon, yeah pardon me for anyone who you know well not just that but just going from the weather itself well, you know yeah, it's, the weather was the last of it because we used to vacation to florida so okay. the first thought was like oh that's neat to live in a place i thought people just vacationed there i didn't know anyone lived there um but it was a lot to uproot and has spent my last two years of high school in florida turned out fine whatever and then came back up to dc uh and that's where you are today and and stayed and it just when i came to look at school here something about dc just struck me gotcha. and I, I was right nice. i came and i stayed perfect so let's kind of take it back a little bit yeah. so um brothers sisters yep. uh one sister three years older than me gotcha uh mother father yes good um so how was your childhood um did your parents sort of encourage you in sort of uh your ideas and sort of your passions and stuff um, did they sort of push you to be creative or did they push you in the interest that you show and which in what what interest did you show when you were a kid? Yeah, I'd say that they definitely encouraged it. Uh, they bought me art supplies. I was never I've, I've talked to a lot of people over the years who said, oh, I was I wanted to be an artist. My parents dissuaded me. They said I had to be a lawyer, doctor. I didn't get any of that. Partly I see now as an adult because they actually weren't that active generally speaking I, I was very much left to myself but on the plus side that worked for me because the type of person I am or nature nurture type of person I became was very self-motivated um so they encouraged it they never ever ever dissuaded me they were happy enough for me to be doing that so you started art at an earlier age yeah I showed talent for it but I, I looking back I see a lot of kids every kid is an artist right but I was happy to be nourished and uh, like I said, given art supplies. And in school, my school in Connecticut was tiny, tiny. 
And what happens in small schools, I think anywhere, is everyone f winds up filling a role. You've got the jock, and you've got the this and the that. I was the artist kid. So being the only artist kid, a class of 50 people, I was encouraged by the art teacher. So I had the same art teacher growing up year after year. So it was definitely, that's probably the most formative part, was going to school. Everyone has art class, but I was always singled out in a good way. Dan is the one, Dan is the artist. Mm -hmm. So I was the go-to if you need posters for your basketball games or the go-to if you needed a campaign poster or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. um, and also just, like I said, the art teacher, I would imagine they were thrilled to have a student with some talent and someone to encourage um did you have any other interests did were you into sort of other things or was sort of art your main um sort of passion and, and interest or did you have any other hobbies were you interested in any other stuff i art was definitely the top i played piano i was pretty good at that for a bit my father was a musician i mean he was a hairdresser he was a musician then he also had a, a real job as people <laughs> say uh so that helped like fostering that kind of lifestyle like there's definitely a creative type in him was there um, uh was there a was there a, a similarity between painting and piano did did they complement each other for you um no i think piano was just something i enjoyed and took lessons and did well at but other interests i think i spent so much time i had one best friend uh, and this is something we get into more in personality side so growing up i always had one best friend and now you know matt is that for me now I'm um, not someone who ever had a circle of friends. So I had a lot of time to myself by choice, by just who I am as a person. So I spent my time in my room was my favorite place and still is. I jokingly call my studio my room. Uh, I'll tell Matt, like, I'm, I'm going to go to my room now. And I close the doors like my room is the most important place growing up. And I loved being in my room, drawing pictures. Just I was all fashion models and typical kind of girly stuff i never drew horses i never did that girl thing uh but art was my favorite and only major hobby and it is a solitary activity so it really fit me in all ways other things i would do though i'd go out hiking we lived in a very woodsy place so i just enjoyed being out walking around hiking playing with my dog mm -hmm. and doing art nice. uh, that's really and listening to music while i did it now did your art uh, we'll get into it a little bit uh -huh. later, but when you first started, you know, typically when you think of like artists as kids, they use sort of crayons, yeah. colored pencils and stuff like that. They don't typically use um, the stuff that you're probably currently using to make your art. Um, is that what you started with or did you kind of go from, I, you know, want to learn to or I'm, I want to start, so I'm going to just start buying oils and sort of that type of stuff? Uh, that probably goes back to school. So I'd the teachers that encouraged me, I was exposed to better art supplies than your pencils and pens. Um, I still have somewhere on the shelf here, a piece of art I did in, I think it was fifth grade. It was a drawing of my house. And on the back, it says, you know, that I got an A plus plus and how impressed my teacher always is and always happy to see what I've come up with. Um, but I mean, in my, when I was doing art in my room, I had, I had some more art supplies than your average kid. Um, like I said, cause they were purchased for me and it was very great that I was, exposed to some better material i wouldn't say i got into oil paint ever until probably high school mm -hmm. so what i mean it it takes a sort of i think a, a certain situation or just how did you get into art period i mean you know it's a very not saying that it's a very niche thing mm -hmm. but it but it does you know, it, it takes a very, I think to me personally, it takes a very special person to get into art and to do art. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't draw anything. Like I am horrible. So what, where, when, what got you? Like what, what was the first thing that came to you when you were that age that said, I want to start drawing. I want to start doing art. So what was kind of that trigger moment or sort of that that moment that you said, this is what I want, I like to do. Right. I don't remember any, any trigger. It, to me, looking back, I can't rewind anything beyond. I just always remember liking it. Uh, what I can put together, though, is knowing now as an adult, as I sit here looking back on my childhood and seeing everything very much more clearly than you do as you're growing up and knowing who my parents are now and seeing them for who they are, who they were. Uh, I think naturally I just like doing art and then how it was built is because like I started to say that they were kind of not hands off, but they, uh, they weren't uh, the most nurturing or you know, nothing bad. I'm not here to 
to throw them under the bus, whatever. Absolutely but, um, not. No, they weren't. I don't know how to even say it. They left me to my own stuff, and that could have been really bad for some other type of kid. So I think since I was independent and a good kid and I kept myself busy and it was my happiest thing to be doing, being left alone gave me the time to do it. But since I was left alone to do my own thing, I was very good at filling that time. Like it was That's okay. a very symbiotic thing, right? Like I, uh, which comes first? Did I become an artist or, oh gosh, I hate when I can't come up with words and I could hear my own voice in my head. Um, <laughs> So your question was sort of like, where does it start? Yeah, where did it start? Yeah. So it started naturally, but it was able to continue because I was just someone who liked to be by themselves and I was left by myself. Mm -hmm. And then no one told me, don't do this. So I think just a very self-directed. And then I had never as a kid, I don't think I ever painted or drew anything that was about anything but I get now that it was a place I went that I could safely be by myself. Let's say they would be arguing. My sister would argue with my parents, my parents arguing with each other, and I'd go to my room in my safe place, and it was just my place to be. Gotcha. Did you did, an, were, did you get to go to museums at like during high school? Did you did you follow sort of artists? Did you were you into uh, sort of art as a kid? Like who were your favorite artists as a kid, stuff like that? <laughs> like, or, or was it just you sort of in your room, you know, sort of doing your thing and, and you weren't really exposed to sort of the outside art world? I certainly wasn't at the beginning. It was just my thing, doing my thing, my place to be and my, my p- place that I like to be happy and what I like to do. Uh, probably wasn't until high school that I started to even know what art was i think or study it or be exposed to anything i don't remember any museums really growing up we lived a couple hours from new york i'm sure i went to one Mm -hmm. but i don't have any memory of being exposed to art and having that play a role at all i mean wholly self-directed it was just me it was just what i did um and when i was exposed to art i think it's so funny and but typical like young not to pick on young women or myself but kind of like typical young girl stuff i like the pretty pictures i like the impressionists Mm -hmm. they were pretty Mm -hmm. uh that is the antithesis of what i'm after now and when i be what i realized i wanted to do with my art once i became into my 20s and 30s that was like it's not my least favorite it's still lovely to look at but to me once i started studying art in college the purpose of art became it had to mean something it had to come from somewhere and I didn't have, I'm lucky for me, I didn't have any major strife or angst, and I didn't go looking for it, but life will bring you purpose, and it brings you experiences, and so with every year that goes by, you realize you have more to pull from, and therefore my art got better um, in many ways. That's a whole other thing to dive into. So speaking of um, college, Mm -hmm. art in college, um, did you know, uh, so senior year high school comes uh-huh. around, you know, you're the, you're the artist of the school and yes. stuff like that. Um, were your plans to go to art school or were you like every sort of other high school kid where it's like, oh, well, I've got to go to college to get that degree in business or, you know, teaching or something like that. So what were your plans, uh, for after high school? Yeah, absolutely not art school. Even growing up, I never thought I'm going to go to art school. I I didn't think the words I'm going to grow up and be an artist. I didn't know that was even an option. Uh, That's something I like to do. I don't think I ever really thought about growing up to be an artist or one way or the other. Uh, So the small school in Westbrook, when I moved to Florida, I was no longer the singled out good art kid. It was a school, I think I had 800, 900 people in my wow. graduating class. I went from 50 to eight or 900. That must have been an experience. It was, it was, but it was good for me. It mm-hmm. just, you know, it shook things loose. It's like, all right, it's a bigger world out there. It was a good step. Uh, but I did find my place because I wound up being president of the arts club. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, so I still was, I guess I still was top of the pile, even in school that large. So that's cool. Um, but I didn't, I knew I wanted to come back up north, so that was why I chose the school. I went to George Washington University. Oh, okay. And so, no, I had no interest in going to art school. I, I'm a smart kid. I, I actually you know, didn't have to take math in college because I should have still because I was good at it. But I was an AP calculus in high school. I was in AP this and AP that. I was 4.0 student, well, 3.8, whatever, if anyone checks the records. They don't never be fact checked here. We're going to go, I everyone's going to go on to <laughs> go George, Wash- yeah, George Washington's um, record yeah, books. To, to Coral see. Springs High School. Yep. Um, no, I was a good student. I, I loved learning. I still do. 
mm-hmm. as a big part of my art is I study things and that's what where my paintings come from so yeah in high school I was like not to say art schools for people that aren't smart but knowing that I was smart I am smart I like to learn I wanted an academic degree so I looked at schools GW spoke to me DC spoke to me so that was sort of the biggest thing I didn't choose Georgetown because their art program wasn't as good so I still wanted to of course get into the arts but I wanted a good school first and then I would do art and figure it out so I came to GW I wound up being an art history and fine arts major because the practical side of of Dan I was like you need a degree in something that you can get Mm -hmm. a job and then the double major was was great that I could do that so I could still pursue the love and a career that had to do with the things I love so I did art history and fine arts uh, major at George Washington. Okay, so you so you went into George Washington with sort of the idea that you would come out with uh, sort of a job and going in the, in, in the arts. So, right. So what would that? So what is that job or what is that role or what is that major? Uh, what was what does that help you do? Like, do you become the director of say a museum or something like that? Yeah, again, I didn't know exactly. I just thought that's a good, seemed like a good step. The the direction I almost went when I was in Florida, I also took architecture classes. It was a, it was a great high school. I mean, I had a lot of opportunity to learn things I wouldn't have in Westbrook, so that's good. So I really loved architecture, and since I was good at math and good at technical drawing, it was a very good fit for me. So I pursued, I went down that road. I took some more advanced architecture classes. I looked into colleges that were for architecture, and long story short decided that wasn't the route for me Mm -hmm. um but yeah so i i did the art history and fine arts degree and being in dc with all the museums i said first step get the degree here i love this place and in this place there's a lot of museums so that seems like a logical good place to find a job and then yeah you see where the future goes from there but Mm -hmm. it's my stepping stones really made a lot of stent a lot of sense um so the first job i got i was still in college i think was my i can't remember what year i got the job I uh, started looking at internships at museums mm-hmm. and got a first internship that I was accepted to was at the Holocaust Museum. So not an art museum. Yeah. Um, but I was like, heck, you know, I'm 19, whatever. Let's get the first job, um, even though I thought that the direction would be the National Gallery or something. Yeah. So I got the job at the Holocaust Museum and said, all right, well, that's interesting. It's history. I like this. And that's what I what took me through a couple of years of college. I interned, moved my way around that museum. Um, and then we can get into the next steps in there. Obviously, I did not go the museum route. The, yeah, so, so <laughs> the end of the story. So while in college, um, you know, you're you're working towards being like you said, being in the museum space or being in the art mm-hmm. space. Um, were you still sort of painting and, and doing your, you, you know, were you still painting, you know, making art and stuff like that? Or did sort of that college role sort of take away from your art? Oh, definitely not. The college art classes, since it was a double major or dual major, um, it was a, a ton of studio art classes and I loved them. I mean, I got to do some things that weren't drawing and painting, which were my my real love, obviously, but yeah, I took pottery, I took jewelry making. Oh, nice. Those are fun. Yeah. Um, but no, it was it was studio art. It was the whole having models and drawing from them. Every class is three hours long, the studio classes. So I spent a lot of time in the studio and a lot of time making art in college. Is um, it yeah. different? Is pottery making <laughs> uh, different or jewelry making different for you as an artist than painting? Oh, God, yeah. Oh, to okay. me, those are those are crafts. Okay. That's That's crafts, not art. Got There's it. arts and crafts, right? I mean, to me, painting is art. And but people who are potters, I'm sure they would say, obviously, they express themselves through their mm-hmm. art, if that's their art. For me, since it's not my art or my way of expressing myself, those are crafts. Got and it. they were fun. Did they help? Did you think that they did it help your um, did it help you grow as an artist? Like, did it did it help at all? Did you did you say that? Oh, OK, this is something that I can adapt to what I do, no. sort of my painting or my <laughs> Just art. A black and white answer. Uh, no, <laughs> it's uh, completely no. different. Uh, yep. You know, jewelry making was it useful? Yeah, it saved me a lot of money. I got of to course. make my own jewelry. True, <laughs> it was but neat. Yeah, unfortunately, th- and this is sort of where I'm coming from because it's one of those things where do does do does art complement or does arts crafts or just sort of the the task of making something, uh, you know, does it does it combine or does it sort of are they mute are they ex, are they mutually exclusive 
or do, do they complement each other? You know, if, if you're learning how to do pottery, does that help you, you know, with painting a pot, you know, or, yeah, or that I mean, type of thing? I think you know? the, the answer I'll give you to that is it's an exp it's expressing something. So it feels good because I love creating things. So if I'm not painting, as we sit here today, if I'm not painting, I'm cooking. If I'm not cooking, I'm doing some I have a sewing machine every now if I like when we take off time at the end of the year around Christmas or whatever a couple of years ago I wound up making handbags I'm like what am I doing I'm not gonna like start an Etsy store of like hand-painted bags by Dana but I can't help but I also don't know how to sit still I'm either doing or I'm sleeping mm -hmm. so any creative outlet it's creative it's great but it so it contributes to my life because I like doing stuff but I don't consider it part of my art those are hobbies that I would do if I'm not painting, if I had a pottery wheel, if I had a house, who knows, I'd probably have one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but well, no, not a pottery wheel. But you know what I mean? Like I'd be making something if I wasn't painting. But painting is my art. It's where I express myself. It's what I do. The other stuff, anything outside of painting and drawing is not art to me. Mm. It's hobby and fun. Got it. Um, but yeah, I'm always like if we're out of town, and we're not painting, which really doesn't happen either. We always have art supplies with us. Yeah, of course. I'll find something. I'll wind up, I don't know, braiding someone's hair, if we're going to say. Like, I'll have to, I have to find something to do. Idle hands, right? Yep. Like, I, yeah. I will be doing something. Awesome. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> so, um, you graduate with your dual major. Yep. Um, now, were you... Uh, did you work for the Holocaust Museum the whole time through, or did, or did you work at different museums, different No, sort just of a couple last years of college. I graduated a uh, semester early, and I thought at the time, like, this is great. It'll give me a jump on everyone graduating, which is a weird thing to think. I'm mm -hmm. like, there's a whole world out there. I don't think these few thousand people from GW are going to change the job market. Um, but, yeah, I graduated this semester early, still with the job at the Holocaust Museum, and then went full-time. It was a great – I mean, I had positions there. I started – just in the campaign department doing peon work, like opening envelopes, um, and then wound up working in the oral history department, which was pretty intense work. I'd sit with headphones like these on all day, listening to survivor testimony, uh, which, my goodness, you can't get yeah, heavier than that. Yeah. Uh, that, so yeah. it was the oral history department, mm -hmm. and there were other people taking the oral histories, and then me as the intern would sit with the headphones and listen to the oral histories and type it up. Uh. I'm obviously a very good typist also. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd have these voices in my head just telling me their stories mm -hmm. of the Holocaust, which was that that interest continues for me to this day. Like if you look at my, my bookshelves, which are plentiful, there is a couple shelves that are all World War II, all Holocaust, all mm -hmm. that era fiction and historical fiction and some history, too. Um, and from there, I wound up getting into the cartography department, which was drawing uh, from aerial photography, making maps that are still used in the Holocaust Museum here in D.C. Mm -hmm. on their their digital. So it was I worked there before the museum opened. It was helping with the development. So I was drawing maps of the concentration camps. I was it was a lot. It was a heavy, heavy job. Mm -hmm. um, but I really loved the I loved the work. So anyway, when I graduated, went full time there. But then with my cartography experience, got hired at map company oh okay ADC the map people they're still in business I believe yeah and yeah like one job leading to so finishing off that story worked at the map company for a couple of years from that mapping experience wound up hearing about a job in a law firm in DC and when they heard I had mapping experience they they thought they could use someone who knows how to use these mapping programs to help when the bank mergers happen um at a long long boring law firm story but wound up getting a job at a law firm be with my mapping experience. So you just don't know where the road's going to take you. Yeah. Um, and worked there for eight years and then quit that to go full time on my art when I was 30 years old. Gotcha. Yep. So let's kind of, I, I want to ask, was, did you know you wanted to stay in DC when oh, you yeah. had graduated? Okay. There oh, was before no. I, yeah. Like okay. when I was 16 and came here, something clicked. So what? I, what was it that did it for you? I mean, like, I mean, because I've I've moved around a little bit and I, I've stayed somewhat like uh -huh. I've stayed in Pennsylvania. But but, uh, you know, I, I, of course, you know, I stayed for a little bit after I went to school and but then I ended up moving. But what was it that sort of made you say that I want to sort of live in D.C.? I can't put my finger on it. I know, like I said, what are you, 16, 17 when you're looking at colleges, right? Yeah. Whatever it was. So I drove up here with my cousin who lived in Bethesda. Um, so I drove up here and it was also a fun trip coming up here and 
uh, seeing DC at that age. Mm -hmm. But I was here to look at schools and something clicked. I don't know what it was. I just know I came home and I was like, that's it. I'm going to school in DC. I'm moving to DC after, co after high school. And I couldn't explain why I didn't know what I was going to do if I didn't get into a school at DC. Mm -hmm. um, I just know I was like, that's where I'm moving. And I came and thought about leaving once, thought about moving to New York when I was like 20 something, mm -hmm. even applied for a job up there. And I'm happy that didn't happen. Yeah. Um, no, DC just was the place and continues to be the place. And mm -hmm. um, it, it fits me very well. Mm -hmm. And could, would you have, would you say that did art play a, a, yeah, a piece of that too? Like, did you, because to me, um, you know, you have, to me, the biggest sort of two biggest art cities are Washington and New yeah. York. So yeah. um, was that one of the things that kind of made you not say to move to like Cleveland or something to work at their museum or something like right, that? Yeah, since I didn't wind up going the museum route, mm -hmm. uh, I think the jobs first, just the one job leading to another life was just taking me on this path. And then once I had it, I, I got married to someone else other than Matt, um, you know, married really young, right out of college. And I just was following this very basic trajectory mm -hmm. it was good it was successful i was happy enough right like i was doing my art on the side I have a good job i have bought a house in rockville i was married the whole mm -hmm. nice little package right and a couple of years go by and i i even had a room in my house with for my for my art for my studio um and then you know no longer married to this person obviously it started to unwind i started to kind of come into myself in my mid to late 20s i i grew up that's what we do right mm -hmm. um so i started when i was doing my art i realized wow i really want to be doing this mm -hmm. so i remember the ex saying to me you're always in that room and matt and i continued to joke like use that saying now you're always in that room so it wasn't in that relationship being an artist wasn't mm -hmm. appreciated wasn't, he wasn't an it, artist no oh, he, okay no it's just a regular guy like nothing mm -hmm. nothing to criticize but it just became not a good fit for me as I started to grow up into who I wanted to be. Gotcha. So I was like realizing I wanted to pursue my art and I was doing art. I was very happy in my room doing mm -hmm. my art again, like childhood. Um, that was my happy place was by myself in my room. Mm -hmm. um, and so as that marriage disintegrated partly over that, not over art, but over who I wanted to become, the house in Rockville and the job at the law firm were not my future. Mm -hmm. I The other joke that came out of it was, I don't know what you think is out there. I'm like, oh, I think there's a lot. Yeah. I think there's a lot out there, and I'm going to go find it. How about mm -hmm. that? So yep. long story short there, I, I extricated myself from that relationship and that marriage, and I moved back into D.C. Oh, okay. And, you know, the rest is history. This is why I'm sitting here today. Nice. Was It, it took, and I, I don't think 25, 26, 27, I'm pretty fortunate that I found that voice at that age, and it didn't take me until I'm 50 in a marriage mm -hmm. and three kids Right. Like I grew up, I think at a good time, it's unfortunate that, but not because I wouldn't change anything in my past because my present is, is exactly where I want to be. So I'm one of those people that says no regrets. Mm -hmm. So it's a good thing that marriage happened. Um, and we, and Matt and I can get into that because we both say that about our ex marriages without our exes, we wouldn't be married to each mm. other. Um, so it's all good, but it, it makes total sense to me how it all un unwound and how I landed here. Gotcha. And I was an active participant in that, right? I didn't just mm -hmm. go, oh, well, I guess this is my life now. Like I actively mm -hmm. pursued what I wanted. And, um, you know, I might not be the most artsy person to meet. I'm, I've never been with the weird hair or the weird clothes. I'm a pretty straight knit looking person. But what, you know, what goes on inside? Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, the, uh, <laughs> never judge a book by its cover, Not I think. Not at all. Yes. And my favorite thing that used to happen at art festivals is people would come up that have seen my work. And like you talked about earlier before we got on the podcast about how you found Matt's work, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and 20 years ago, but it took 20 years before you met him. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've had that not 20 year story, but people who have said, oh, I've known your work for X, you know, X number of years. And then they meet me. And I was told more than once back in the festival days, wow, you're, you, you look so normal. Like I didn't expect you to look like this um, because they only knew my art and my art made them think mm. I was going to have like three heads and, you know, I don't know what exactly they thought because nowadays would be a different description but um yeah i i don't present that way <laughs> <laughs> so so you mentioned about how you were doing chartography and like yes. that type of thing did that um 
did that help you become a better artist? Or so you were doing chartography as well as painting, I assume. So you were yeah. doing sort of your thing on the side. Right. Did they complement each other? Did they? Um, were they sort of completely different? Did you learn how to do one based on doing the other? Sort of how does that work? I mean, because uh, I've seen your art now, and I don't know. I I, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Again, I don't. I've looked at your website and 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 seen your art, but I don't think it goes back that far. Yeah, or does it goes it? back to probably the late nineties. There's oh, okay. a couple of things from pre going full time. Gotcha. Like some you know old stuff when I was just noodling around with it right before okay. I really took it on. So so what was that? Explain to me what it's like doing chartography and then doing your art and how how they complement each other were they different how did you what did you do or sort of give me your experience yeah. with that that's a pretty good question i've never tied it together i think that it starts with the architecture and the cartography go kind of hand in hand they're very precise these are precise things with little tiny pencils and rulers and straight lines and um not necessarily math but very it's rigid and and exacting and that speaks to my soul i am like a, a kind of an organizational freak this things are labeled in the house. My books are alphabetized. Everything has a place in, um, yeah, it's my natural place is to be a little uptight maybe. <laughs> um, or let's just say orderly. I'm mm -hmm. very orderly. So it, the cartography and the architecture speak to that side of me and my art in its natural place. And probably because I was trained, I am trained to also do well and trained to get A's. I, I'm an A student. I got A's in art class because I did it right. And part of my artist statement that I wrote years and years ago is I'm trying to unlearn all of that. So I've been 20 years in now of full-time painting, trying to unlearn that exacting thing. Everything doesn't have to be perfect. Everything's not, it's not a photograph. Now I love uh, photorealistic paintings. They're impressive, but it's not what I want to be doing. But my natural place, if I'm left to my own devices, I'm going to be drawn to that painting in the museum that's perfect. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to want to go home and paint something perfect. And so I have to tear myself away from that. Go look at the German Expressionists. Go look at a Pollock. I'm, I don't like the drips, but I love the story. I love the expression. I love the emotion. It's not my natural place. So the things that speak to that orderly part of my, my artistic self that makes sense, it was kind of nice to have that satiated at work so I could then come home and paint and do something that meant something that used you know used your whole body and I, i'm not one to throw myself into it but it's it's very different there's orderly stuff and then there's art but if i'm if i'm just painting without reminding myself to loosen it up i will do tight little perfect things and it's not where i want to be i'm good at it mm -hmm. i'm very good at it i can make pretty little pictures but it's not what i want to be doing yeah um so you're you're doing your art on the side um do you are you just doing it for you while you're doing the chartography stuff or at what point do you start to paint and say well maybe i could sell this or people want to buy this yeah i was i was doing that all along the way and that's oh, okay. why the contention in the ex-marriage it was i was doing this and it starts off just with friends everyone starts that way like your friends want this and i was doing sculptures there's a silly one still sitting up there that i used to do um and there's a whole Matt and I story behind that too, which we could get into later. Yeah. It's pretty funny. Um, so yeah, I was, I was trying to sell it at this point since I had the job and I was doing my art and I'm in my mid to late twenties now. And I start realizing I can do this. I, I want to pursue this. I want to do my art. And I never remember thinking exactly like my goal is to be able to quit my job and do this, but I knew I could do it. And I knew I, and I was doing it on the side and started selling it. I started pursuing shows um and it was tiny and not much at the beginning but yeah no i started i did not just paint for myself i mm -hmm. painted because i wanted to start to do this for a living one day yeah and i was gonna see how to get there did your co-workers at the chart <laughs> like at the attorney the, the law the office firm, yeah. the, did they know that you were a painter oh yeah and yeah. what did they did they like oh she does were they sort of were they interested in it were they you know, did anybody ever from the law firm buy any oh, of your definitely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And it became another situation that 
kind of like in my small school in Connecticut, I was the artist, right? There's this big group of people or not so big group of people and everyone plays a role. And so here we have this big law firm, like biggest firm in DC, one of the biggest firms in DC. And there's again, 800 people, whatever they are into this, in this office space. And out of all of them, I still was known by pretty much everyone because I was the artist. Uh, I had a job as it was the graphic arts department where I started there. So all in all, I mean, you have this law firm full of lawyers and secretaries and whatnot, and there's only one graphic artist. So I was, again, that one person. Oh, it's Dana the artist. So they knew I was on the side. It was also my job at the law firm. Anything outside of law or the basic stuff, if no one knew where to turn, they're like, that must be a job for Dana. <laughs> like, Because it doesn't fit into any of the other departments that everyone knows about. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was the, the go-to for anything creative in the firm as well. Nice. Um, so do you, it kind of it probably happened way before but do you remember selling your first painting like the first real sort of official i just sold a painting yeah i yeah. think i did well maybe not the very first but of the course. first one that i remember is significant it was um the movie frida came out okay yeah yeah. if you remember that i don't know what year that was probably 2001 ish 2002 maybe um so as the art history buff that i am and all of that of course i went to see it loved it uh, love her work and came home and painted a portrait of myself as Frida. I mean, not the most creative thing, but it's what I, I do a lot of riffs on classic paintings. Mm -hmm. So it's a painting of me as Frida and like the red dress and gave myself a nice unibrow and holding a picture, holding my cat. And then I put Frida's face on the cat. It's a little surrealism mixed oh, in. Oh, nice. It was a beautiful, very tight, you know, very Dana <laughs> at the time, tight, perfect oil painting. Mm -hmm. And it sold and it was it was great because it was a self portrait. It was something about me. It was something current. And and it it that's interesting. I've never really thought of it this way as that being the first painting I remember selling because it was for real money, not just like a twenty dollar thing. Um, it was a real official painting. Mm -hmm. And I was very proud of it. And it's it's funny that it was a self portrait and uh yeah, it, it fed what I needed, which is this is a direction that will work for you. Yeah. So you just continued to, so you were doing both. So you were working for the law firm. Oh, yeah. And and then, so was the, was the law firm the last uh, sort of professional job, or not, not please don't take it that way, but <laughs> was, was, or corporate, let's say corporate, corporate job. Yes, that's the right word. Was, was, was the law firm the last corporate job before you decided to become an artist full time? Oh, yeah. It okay. was. So it was eight or so years there. And I asked to go part time. Oh, okay. I thought, you know, I, I'm doing a good job here. And I think that it's respected. And I know I could do what I'm doing. You don't want to tell your mm -hmm. boss that I could do what I'm doing in half the time. So mm -hmm. what are you doing with the rest of your time here? I asked to go part time thinking it would be a nice, safe thing to do. And thank goodness they said no. Mm -hmm. And I think what they expected is to say no. And I would stay like a good girl. And I said they said no. And I was like, all right, then I quit. And they were surprised, and I looked back and was like, "That was a huge risk." Well, that was what I was, it was ask. a huge yeah. risk. So, what was the deciding factor? Like, what what sort of put you over the edge that you said, "Okay, I can quit my corporate job and become an artist full time"? So, what was that sort of? What was the sort of the 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 tipping point or the stepping stone or sort of the big thing that happened that made you say, "Okay." I'm going to do this. Well, it's kind of a, so I was already uh, divorced at this time. Um, so I was on my own. I was taking the bull by the horns. I was like, this is it. This is my life. This is what I'm doing. I'm going to take a risk. I'm only 20, well, how old was I? 29 years old. I'm losing track of time. No, it was third because I divorced at 29, 30. So let's say I was 30 ish. Um, it, it was a now or never thing. It was a, whatever if this doesn't work i can get another job so i gave myself a time how many months i would try this i had x number of, i was very careful x number of months of money in the bank i am a risk taker but a very well planned one <laughs> a careful risk taker i don't know mm -hmm. so yeah i planned for it i was thought i'm gonna try it i'm gonna do this were you nervous were you scared were I you excited have been. i should have been i look back i'm like my art was kind of terrible back then i look at those paintings i'm like god if i were the 52 year old me meeting the 30 year old me i'd been like honey you know you need to get a little better i know what are you thinking you can't live off of this so i still tell young people if they ask like young people like a 30 year old's a young person how old am i um 
I don't say I would never tell someone not to do it, but very straightforward. Like there's so many reasons, so many things that factor in. You can't tell someone it will or won't work for them. But I look back, I'm like, that was a huge jump. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm very confident person and I, you know, I can do anything. Mm -hmm. So I thought I'm going to do it. I'm going to try it. I think I can do this. And if I can't, you know what, I'll find another job. I'm very employable mm -hmm. um, at the time. <laughs> I'm not now. No one would put up with me now. <laughs> Did it ever get to that point where were you were you ever at that point where you said, OK, I may have to go back no. to the. OK, no, not for a minute. Um, I was I started teaching class. It's another business I had on the side uh, uh, while I was still at the law firm. I had come up with a business at the law firm during the summer program. They have summer associates and they wine and dine them. So I came up with this idea to do painting classes with the summer associates i called it art at work it was um i'd set up in a law firm's conference room and i did it for my own law firm first and so once i did it with them i could go the next year and say well scadden arps did it you want to do it too they're like oh my god if scadden do it we should do it too so i grew it from my firm one year and grew it i think i did it i don't think it was quite 10 years i'd have to look back um yeah setting up after work in the summer for summer associates to come and, and paint for a couple of hours. Now there's the whole sip and paint thing. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I you invented that. I yes. credit myself with oh, it. Oh, absolutely. Because it was in the 90s. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. this was, it certainly didn't exist as a store. Yeah. And maybe it existed somewhere else was doing it. I'm not saying the first person on earth to come up with this, obviously. But the whole business model, I, I really grew it and then had a, like 10 firms by the, the last summer I did it. Okay. Um, so that was a business. It was only two months a year business, but I knew I had a business that made X number of dollars and summer was coming up X number of months after I quit my job. So I was like, oh, at least in May, I'm going to start making money. Mm -hmm. um, so that was part of it, but that certainly wasn't going to be enough to live on, but it was something. So you taught people how to paint in, or you... Summer, you help or like they it was, yeah so they were the, yeah, they would copy for me. yeah so yeah i would um pick or give the law firm administrator 10 choices say a picasso a van gogh like recognizable classic paintings and i won't say they're easy to copy because they're freaking masterpieces mm -hmm. right um but things that were very straightforward pictorial images that someone could see that they might be able to make a copy of. So they'd pick from this list of paintings I gave them. I would draw, like, do a very basic drawing on all the canvas. They had a, a class of 30 summer associates. I would sketch it really quick, just the outlines on the canvas. Give everyone a palette, give them a five minute blah, blah, blah. This is how you paint your, your tools. And then just spend a couple hours walking around the room facilitating. And people would make these great copies of mm -hmm. masterpieces, and then the law firm might have a little show of them the next day, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Can the painter, the painter can paint, but can the painter teach? Yes. You were very good. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm so obnoxious. Yes. I'm no, no, no. <laughs> I just, again, it's, it's one of those things, you know, where, you know, it, it, the, what is it like the athlete is an athlete, but the athlete can't coach. So right. the painter is a very good painter, but can the painter teach painting? Right. And it's, I like to be the complete opposite of that horrible saying that like those who can't yes. teach, like yep. that's a terrible thing to say to teachers who were good at their craft. But I was a painter who could teach, not a teacher who could paint. Um, I, yeah, I was very good at it. And I knew that because the other job I had at the law firm, I wound up heading up their training department. So I had learned that I was already good at and enjoyed that process of teaching. So I was teaching lawyers how to use computers because that's how old we are. I was getting them, they, I was like their first introduction into using computers and word perfect and word and all that mm -hmm. um so i learned I, I enjoyed teaching so i was like well if i'm going to teach people how to use computers and programs i could surely teach them how to paint because i know a lot more about that mm -hmm. um yeah it was it was fun it was a it was hard work um because it was a lot of schlepping a lot of bringing yeah. 30 canvases and 30 easels and mm -hmm. all the paint and everything um but it was a, it was a good business i'm very proud of having done it and nice. then that too that ran its course how long did that last um i I'd have to go back, but I think seven ish summers I, oh, wow. I did that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I grew it every year. Gotcha. Was there anyone that um, that you looked at and said, wow, this person has a lot of talent? Like, yeah, did, they were the yeah. ones who you found out that they always wanted to be a painter and mm -hmm. their parents told them they had to be a lawyer or mm -hmm. a doctor. So there's a, there was a, a good number of people who had these really great 
gifts for painting but it obviously it wasn't their passion but mm -hmm. they they really enjoyed it and it, you, that was nice to bring to people do you know if anybody ever sort of started to do it part-time or did you ever in your sort of art circles did anyone ever sort of said oh i took your class like five years ago and now i do it did did you ever have that sort no. of experience where <laughs> no one ever became well not another side story no one from the law firm that i know i've ever really pursued it i hope they you know may bought themselves paint sets and did it on their kitchen table mm -hmm. i'm sure a few people did sort of get that rekindled um but then i wound up teaching art classes out of my studio oh okay as well so this is how i was able to live as an artist back when my art was not so well developed and you also have to build a a base of people you don't just start sell well not everyone just starts selling and gets discovered like the man in the other room over there <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah i mean it's interesting our conversation has been so much on my business end um and yeah i've always had this living breathing artist inside of me but it has taken a very normal set of steps right i was a normal person went to high school went to college got a good job and this is the advice i'd give anyone that wanted to pursue it um, and I, I hope that some of the appeal of my story to the other normal people out there is, is I, I, I'm, I'm a pretty normal, 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 uh, it's not an extraordinary story. Um, I just really wanted it. Um, I am really good at it, I believe. And I, I think there's got a thousand steps of better i can get uh, this is just where i am now mm -hmm. um i look forward to hopefully a long life and doing everything i can to get there um so there's always better but it's not extraordinary like matt's story is extraordinary um which you'll Please have plenty listening. of time yeah, to but, tell but him no, <laughs> to hear his story afterwards but. yes but matt is extraordinary in his own way right you're extraordinary in your own way because again my life is i did the corporate thing i'm a normal just regular person it and and that's the reason why i asked to interview you because to me art has or people doing sort of something that is not saying that it, against the going to work the nine to five yeah. job but especially art right um any form of art whether it be painting music sort of that type of thing it's it it's very there's just so many things that you can and that's why I'm doing the interview because yeah. there's so many things about because your story is going to be completely different than Matt's but it's and again it's just to me it's so interesting well, so yeah going back to I think I made a crack earlier like I was safe to leave the job because I knew mm -hmm. I was employable and then laughingly said I'm not anymore so going into that like now that I've really grown up and had 30 years or how many years since being in the corporate world um and I've I've come into my own and I now I'm not afraid to say stuff anymore and I've really come into who I am and what I believe and so I say to my art people who follow my art and have seen it over the years I have waded into some very very difficult territory mm -hmm. there was a period of time where all my paintings were about being an atheist being an agnostic I would say agnostic now then I was touting atheist um I'm an atheistic agnostic, if you want to get technical. And, you know, that talk about the things you're not supposed to talk about, religion, politics, and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, for me, the whatnot is oh, now I'm a vegan, right? So, mm -hmm. like, I have waded into very difficult territory. I've painted about politics, and that's the most polarizing thing we have right now. Mm -hmm. So, for me, like, the normal, 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 this normal path. But once I was able to go and do my art full time and really come into myself and who I am... Um, I realize I'm not so normal because the, the things that are mainstream, the things that are normal, I don't fit in. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I see women at brunch, just as an example, and I'll be like, oh, I've never had that group of friends. I don't have a bunch of friends. Like Matt's my one person. I have a couple of women who are friends, acquaintances, but it's, there's just no time. Like we live and breathe art and it is not normal. And we forget, we lose sight if people could see where we're sitting, we lose sight that how we live isn't normal. But anytime someone walks in the front door of our studio, they're like, whoa, what is this? Um, so, yeah, here I am saying it's I'm just like everyone else, but I'm I'm really not at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very proud of that. And I, I kind of wish we could go down that route more and I could get more of that out there in the world because um, I think my art shows it. 
Mm -hmm. And I have so much to say, and we live in a world that I think we've, uh, it's become less safe to really express yourself with oh, absolutely. words, the art, I can get away with some stuff, mm -hmm. right? Like I can get away with shit with my art, but mm -hmm. that I won't say out loud mm -hmm. um, because it's too black and white when you say how you actually feel, but that's thank mm -hmm. God for the paintings. Yeah, that's what I was going to, and we can go through that, but, but again, the paintings, the words are are out there, yeah. and unless they're recorded, you know the yeah, way yeah. the way. It, but to me, you're you you're saying your point through your paintings because they will last. Yes, you know. So the words, you know, saying stuff may only last a day, yep. two seconds, but but the art will be forever. Yeah. So, um, so let's kind of. So I have a. I want to ask. So you you full you've decided. Okay, I am going to quit my job at the mm -hmm. at the law firm. I am going to do art full time. Um, who was your biggest? Uh, who was the biggest encourager of you to do that? So who was the one that said, "You know what? You should do this. I think you're great." Sort of who encouraged you the most to make that, or sort of after you made that decision, um, you know, gave you the sort of the the positivity that helped sort of put you on that path. Two answers to that. The first one is me, as it has been my whole life. It's me. I've done this. I did this myself. Nobody helped me. Um, you know, thankfully, I had my parents gave me shelter. They gave me anything I wanted. Right? I was, uh, I was very fortunate on that. But it's it's me who did and got myself everywhere. Um, and quitting my job, it was me. I was a single. Well, Matt and I had just met, okay. so I'll, I'll, the second part of the answer is it's also him. But first and foremost, me. I did this. I encouraged myself, and I knew I could do it. Um, the second part is when I uh, met Matt, I stole the law firm. I met him, knew he was a full-time painter, and was very interested to meet him and talk to him about that. Um, so, but dating, like, it wasn't like there was some future I knew was held in this. But it, he did play a role in that. I had met him at that juncture. I thought, all right, this is what full-time art looks like. I went to his studio, and I was like, well, this is this is a mess <laughs> i need to clean this place up now um you'll hear more about that later well, it's I'm kind sure. of funny we're in your <laughs> studio and i i went to go to the restroom and i walked through your studio <laughs> right. and then i walked through his and two different worlds yes it is very it is you it is definitely the whole like yin and yang yeah. sort of thing but it was it i i had a i just realized that when you sang that it it, it is true so it's kind of funny yeah, yeah so so it was me that did it. It was me that let myself do it, told myself I could do it, and made it happen. Um, but it does, it's inextricable from the time that he and I met and what role that played as well. So I was like, all right, here's a guy. I just met this guy. He's a full-time painter, and I picked his brain a bit. And um, to me, I have to see things. I always have to try the shoes on and walk around in them, too. So I thought, oh, let's, I'll, I'll give it a try. Like I said, I'll... I'll try on these shoes. I'm going to quit my job, give it a whirl. And if it doesn't fit, well, we'll take a new direction. But yeah, I met him right at that, at that point. So that played a role as well. Who was your biggest distract or uh, discourager, let's say? Who said that, oh, Dana, you're crazy. Why are you quitting your... No one. Oh, I, okay. I, again, I didn't have... I was single and I'm me. And my parents don't play a role, didn't play a role in my life, mm -hmm. in my adult life. Like, they were there. I mean, it's speaking to them, whatever. Mm -hmm. But they were not people who had the... Um, the the grounds even some they're your parents but to me the relationship was not one at which they had any grounds to tell me anything mm -hmm. um and they didn't good or bad right um they never tried to tell me do or don't do stuff mm -hmm. um but that's just not who they were and that's not the type of relationship that was there so mm -hmm. yeah i i didn't have any detractors nice well, that's good. I didn't have any. <laughs> well, there, you I'm probably just had the critics. Way I like it. Yeah, or critics. You might have had critics, but oh, they, nothing. I'm sure they were out there going. Always, yeah. yeah, there's always critics, but but more so, it's it's that thing of is who you know you kind of have that person that encourages you, and then the person that always sort of makes you sort of double think or sort of say, well, did I do a good thing or did, was this a good idea? Yeah, and maybe I'm delusional. Maybe someone I, I don't know who it would have been because mm -hmm. again, I wasn't in in touch with anyone there was no one there i was mm -hmm. and maybe that's willful ignorance or purposeful setting up my life like i don't want to hear it so i just don't talk to anyone mm -hmm. <laughs> so so you decide to go full-time mm -hmm. um 
Did your sort of style, your sort of your process, uh, I like, I don't, your, I could say find your medium or mm-hmm. find your, did it take you a while or did you, did, did you take you a while to find that medium once you quit the, the law firm or did you sort of have that already established and you just sort of took that and just rolled with it? Uh, the medium didn't change. It was oils and acrylics. Style. And, uh, stylistically, that's where the breaking from the realism came in. Okay. So stylistically, my my place was was realism. I'm good at this. I'm good at illustrating this, at, at expressing this very literally. So what happened after I went full time was when I was given the opportunity mentally and uh, physically in that time and space, right? I had the time and the place to really explore things. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't until I quit and went full time that I like finally tried to explore different styles and started to explore expressing myself as opposed to just painting an idea. Yeah. Did you try like what kind of what were those sort of techniques or sort of things that you tried and stuff like that? What was it different paints? Was it different um, sort of what you painted on uh, the um, the themes, stuff like that? Yeah, this is where the, the timing with Matt comes in. So mm-hmm. since we had just started dating and just met, um, his style was the influence. It was Matt going, you should circle the mouth, you should, or circle the eye, you should put red lips. That's our running joke, like just circle the eye and put red lips on it, it'll be better. So if you look at the art I was making right when we met, you will see the CISO in it. You will see mm. Matt's voice uh, influencing that. But he was obviously the closest person in my life and the closest art I had exposure to. So it makes sense that that's going to rub off the most. Um, but I wanted to keep that in check and put it in its place. So it was more about than just going to museums more because I had the time. So I was exposing myself to everything and I'd come home and experiment and goof or like fool around in say I saw a Modigliani exhibit that day. I would riff on Modigliani that day. So I just, I would try everything. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I, the way I see it is you try a little bit of everything and something sticks from that. Yeah, that was my next question. So how long after or how soon after did you say okay this this works this sticks like i this is where i feel the most comfortable i don't think there is or, any one thing because if you're if you look at all of my work mm-hmm. it's a little schizophrenic <laughs> i find myself i think i'm very sane but mm-hmm. my art might lead you to believe i'm schizophrenic that i might be like at least three four five different people mm-hmm. because on any given day like there'll be maybe three four days where i'm i painted crows right they're like mm-hmm. yeah i've noticed crows that yeah or, um, coming up in April, I'll probably spend a week or two painting pretty little watercolors of cherry blossoms and bees. Mm-hmm. And then partly is just because I have all these different styles I like to do that I, I like to explore them. And one day, this style is best for this subject matter and this style is best for a different subject matter. Um, and they all live inside of me. It just depends on, <laughs> depends on the day and the mood. Um, oh, I was going somewhere else with that. Oh, which one sticks there? There's... I always thought that one day, I guess it could still happen. Hopefully I still have 50 years of painting left in me. One day something was going to stick. So that's why I always try everything, take a little piece of it, and eventually they'll all coalesce into Dana's style. It still hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. But I guess my style is all of these styles, or I'm just telling myself that. But there's, I have cubism, I have realism, I have expressionism, I'm all these things. And I still do believe I'm supposed to coalesce into something one day, and I still believe it'll come. Mm-hmm. Um, but for now, it's a, everything has its time and place. So it depends on what I'm trying to do with my art, what's the message that day, or what's my subject matter. And that's the style that comes out. Gotcha. Um, so you're doing sort of those corporate gigs where you're having sort of those law firms sort of mm-hmm. you're supplementing your yeah. um, your income from, you know, just your own paintings. Right. So how hard is it to... Or give me an idea about um, trying to get your art out there. So not the corporate stuff, not the not the like teaching, but you doing your art and then selling it. So how how hard is it um, to sort of you know are does DC offer a lot of art fairs where you're able to come and set up? Um, are you sort of just every weekend doing something? You know, or are you traveling to different cities to sell your art? So sort of give me the the Dana personal art mm-hmm. selling and how, again, was it a struggle? 
you know, was it hard or was it easy? Did did DC or did the did the art scene in DC allow you to kind of uh, you know make selling your art easier okay there's a then and now answer okay now it's a hundred percent online yeah uh, and it has been for and it everything else led to this day um now it's a hundred percent online paint all day every day you know for the most part mm -hmm. uh, we paint all the time post it online post it on social media and it gets out there i mean countless you, you can't quantify how many people i don't mm -hmm. have a counter on my website but and social media, that's how art is sold now. That's how it 100%. Everything that led to that, in the earliest days, there were art fairs doing, say, Adams Morgan Day or Arts on Foot in D.C. Um, art shows at art galleries pursuing those, actively pursuing them. And the sign of success, everyone always, at, they, they ask less now because I think everyone's getting used to the fact that the art gallery is not the most pervasive. But they're, they're just not around as much anymore. They're still, they're still there, but they're not playing as big of a role but the question is always, what shows do you have coming up? Mm -hmm. And there used to be an answer to that always. I'd have, I could have four or five solo shows in a year um, and then a bunch of group shows. That was how it was done, and I kicked its ass. I did, I did great in that time. I did festivals, had shows all the time, pursued them around the country, around the world. And um, it started to dwindle as it started to focus more on the Internet, but it also started to dwindle because that became less of the way the art world is working, or at least the part of the art world I chose to participate in. There are still art galleries, but it's just not the world that I travel in. It's, I was saying it's fancy, it's expensive. Mm -hmm. Whereas my art is about painting it, selling it, painting it, selling it, not $10,000. Like basic paintings are usually a couple hundred dollars it's a big deal to paint something that's closer to a thousand um it's all about just painting and selling it and getting it out there so if you travel in the art gallery world that is not a feasible solution that's that's interesting because i was going to ask like i've always been the the whole gallery thing and mm -hmm. that was always sort of how i looked at it do you miss the do you miss the art fairs do no. you miss okay <laughs> you like selling online you yeah. i mean you don't mind it's not you're okay you know that sort of interaction with people that I'm, type of yeah. thing you're you're okay with just someone emails you or contacts you yeah. and says hey i like your painting i like to buy it and you ship it to them or you know typically maybe some people come to your studio and pick it up or yeah, something so like that same answer as whether it's relationships life choices anything there's no regrets in the past i mean thank goodness for all those things they were they were great mm -hmm. um i i enjoyed it yeah it's tough sitting at an art festival and having people make faces <laughs> so it's not 100 percent enjoyable but the art fair was great i mean it's it's amazing i wouldn't be here without all the things i did do so i'm not poo-pooing anything from the past mm -hmm. um it's just not where i am today um, so someone who is starting, I'd say, go do all the, you have to pay your dues. You got to go sit at the art fair and have people like right in front of you go, what is this shit? <laughs> right. Um, they, you have to do that. You have to put in your time and put in the stages, I believe. Um, so it's just not where I am today, mm -hmm. but no, the art fairs were great. The art shows were great. I enjoyed them for what they were. I'm not really a people per, like I'm good. I enjoy when I have time with people. It's necessary and I love to be able to like talk and I would, I wish there was more of uh, people who were willing to really banter. Um, and here we're not talking about anything heavy. Mm -hmm. um, this is great. You're just asking me about myself, which is always nice. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I would love to, to get down with a group of people and really just talk about things, mm -hmm. everything. It, it's very fulfilling. Um, so an art show was great because people would ask me about my art and I got the opportunity to tell them what the paintings meant and I got to hear their feedback and why it appealed to them. It's very good insight. Um, but yeah, after a little bit of it, I need to lock myself in a room for a week by myself to recover. Mm -hmm. So it's great. It's important. I enjoy it for what it is, but it's not where I want to live. Yeah. So do you remember, um, so you did shows, you did yeah. galleries. So, um, what was so do you remember or maybe explain the difference between it are shows and galleries the same thing um, or or because 
the way I always think of it is, is that, you know, you have a, a showing. So a bunch of your mm -hmm. paintings are displayed. It's your sort of the, the Dana show where you provide all of your paintings and stuff like that. A place puts them up and then you have, you know, people come and look at them right. and stuff like that. Is that's, and then is there also where, let's say a, a museum or like a permanent space mm -hmm. maybe does various artists every couple of months you know that type of thing so they maybe ask you for a painting to put in their gallery is that sort of how it is that sort of the way it works in that scene is it one of those two things and or even do you get invited to be a per in a permanent collection like do they ask you hey we would like to have one of your paintings and we're going to put it up in perpetuity let's say yes please someone ask me that that okay. would be nice um no i do not have any museum shows okay. i've been in uh, a couple of museum exhibits at the, the Visionary Museum where Matt had his solo show. In Baltimore. And, yeah, in Baltimore in 2017. Okay. Uh, one of the, the the first piece, actually, the, the intro piece next to his bio, the text of his bio, was my painting of him, oh, which nice. was just amazing. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, I was in a museum show, um, and that was up for six months. Um, and I was in a museum show in Russia, uh, called Art of Grotesque or Grotesque Art. I can't remember the exact title, but that's museum shows are are that that's huge. That's like the top. Yeah. So um, how does that happen? So so how does how do you get the do you get an email? Do they call you? You know, saying oh we're a museum in in Russia or you know we're the Visionary Art Museum in Baltimore. We'd like a like a painting. Yeah. Well, the the Baltimore show is because it was Matt's solo. Okay. I mean, gotcha. That was Matt's so solo show. And a painting by Dana Allen. Um, that was so probably the that, best that, painting that, there, too. Oh, yeah, He's yeah, not yeah, listening. Don't ask so, him. Yeah, yeah. That was probably the best. <laughs> no, he agrees, everybody, he well, that's, hey, you're, there, you're the first You were the first painting they <laughs> oh. see when they walk into his. So, again, they yeah, have the. So, favorites, favorite and most painful scene, if you've seen the movie Pollock, mm -hmm. um, where Lee Krasner you know, married to Pollock and Pollock's drunk off his butt, like always, and uh, Peggy Guggenheim comes and. Lee brings the, brings her up to what was their shared studio, and Peggy Guggenheim goes, L. Krasner, I didn't come here to see L. Krasner. Who the hell is L. Krasner? And that's like, welcome to my world. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, <laughs> so many stories there. So, no, okay, so there's museum shows, which I've been fortunate enough to be in those, too. Mm -hmm. Then there are gallery shows, and those are just art galleries, you know, like storefront art galleries and that's mm -hmm. what i did many 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 of over the years gotcha and so how is, does yeah yeah so how does the so we'll kind of i want to get the i want to get kind of how it works for both so in a museum show like the one in russia mm -hmm. how does do you get an email from like a russian email address <laughs> and like then they say oh, we would like a painting of yours or so how does it work like it's yeah it's a, the they said what and that one too it's um, they first invited Matt to do it. His name's out there. He's, he's the museum guy. Um, so they invited him to be part of the show, and then he was kind enough to introduce them to my work, or I don't know, if, oftentimes they people have asked, not for museum shows, but it's in the art world, you often get asked, like, do you know anyone else who might fit this or who would be good on the show? So he introduced them to my work, and I had two pieces that were, like, the most extraordinary perfect fit for this call. And um, I'm sure there's been times in life where I've, gotten things because of like someone thinks they have to do something for me because he's in it and i god if anyone's listening never do that never mm -hmm. just give me or anyone something because you think you have to or because they are mm -hmm. just married to or whatever um so they they curated them in though they curated into my pieces so it's yeah he he got an email and i and he was pursued and then i was fortunate enough to be introduced and they they chose to cure me mine in as well did you get to pick the paintings that you wanted to no, give. No, there were two. Was, okay. Since it was the art of the grotesque, I was like, oh, do I have grotesque for you? I I have some very grotesque paintings. And Did you give them a couple of them? Yeah, to they were. They got to choose, yeah. though. You don't get to pick for them. You, you don't say to them, here's the ones that I want to give you. Well, yeah, because not, I don't think all of my paintings are grotesque. So we gave them, uh, I don't know if I gave them more than the two that were accepted or the one that was accepted or that because it was just a perfect fit. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, out of the, I'd say tens of thousands of paintings I've done, it would be a lot for someone to say, here, go find one. So mm -hmm. yeah, you do present to a show when there's a call, the work that fits for that motif. Did you, uh, and then I'm assuming you ship it or, yeah, okay. Yeah. Did you get to see, did they sh like get to show you where it was displayed? Oh yeah, did there you... were great photos and videos. We have a website put up for it. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sweet. 
Um, and then, so now you, you, you mentioned about the sort of the gallery shows mm-hmm. where, you know, like, like we would normally see in a city or something like that. How does that, how does that work? Like, does someone come to you and say, Donna, we would like to f- uh, feature your paintings in our gallery? Mm-hmm. First, can I, could I go back and tell you about the piece that oh, was in the Russia show? Absolutely, absolutely, so by all you means. want to talk grotesque, so a painting of mine called Baby Back Ribs. Um, so I do paint on the subject of animal rights and vegetarian veganism often. Of course. And But when I started on that subject years ago, I, as I tend to be, just like really heavy-handed on a subject, just like I have so much to say. I'm like, girl, you just throw it all out there. Mm-hmm. And then I learned to soften things, which is good. So this is from my early days on the subject matter, which means it's my most brutal um, illustration of it. So baby back ribs. It is a child baby sitting on a platter with his back to you Mm -hmm. and his back is peeled open. So you can see his ribs, baby back ribs. Um, Because when I hear the term baby back ribs, that old Chili's commercial. Oh, yes, of course. Which I will not torture you by singing right now. Yeah, plus we would probably get like copyright. Yeah, Yeah, something like that. I can't afford to be sued, Dana. Sorry. (laughs) can I. (laughs) Goodness, let's keep it safe. Um, You probably get sued for swearing. Is this like an FCC thing? I don't know. I apologize. I swear a lot. You know what? They have to. um, I didn't learn about it either, but. You have like when you upload it, it there's like a checkbox that says, <laughs> "Is it explicit?" Oh. And people have said like shit, yeah, like once in a while, I, but but it hasn't been. I, I don't think any no f bombs have been dropped. I don't think I have. No, you haven't. Okay. No, no, no. And that's the thing too. I think it's shocking. I don't know if I have to check the box if okay, I'll try not because you know how it's like with like PG thirteen yeah. or whatever. You're allowed to say like one f word. I don't know how that works. Oh, really, you're something allowed like one? that. Okay. I think there's like something with movies I where no, no well, I, please. I, you know what? <laughs> if I if I had somebody previously that did it and I could figure out what would happen, right? You know, no, I won't but I would it. hate to check not check the box and, and then, then no someone says this. yeah that someone says as the f word and then they're like by the way you need to do i would have i yeah. just would be okay. I, I i won't I'm, get us in trouble i'm so new to this like <laughs> up i just upload episodes and hope it comes back and says it's been uploaded it'll be posting nice. on this day so okay. I'll try yeah to keep it clean no, kind no of problem. A, I, I grew up with people who swore a lot oh like my first word was oh no won't say it. okay <laughs> so baby back ribs so a child on a platter okay. with his back exposed his ribs exposed it's gruesome it's awful it's like I remember painting it and Matt and many others said, who's going to buy this? I'm like, oh, I don't know. I, but I had to paint it. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> how many times those words have been spoken in the studio from him to me going, who's going to buy that? I'm like, I don't know, but I need to paint it. Mm-hmm. So and sometimes you paint something really terribly grotesque and it winds up in a museum. Yeah. Did somebody eventually buy it? Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> in Russia yeah. or did someone? No, here. Oh, okay. And I actually came and picked it up um, in person. Oh, So it was nice. a DC person. Was it not to, not to you know, uh, call them out, but was it some, did you, the, when they came in, did, did they look like someone that would <laughs> Do like. Do I look like someone who would well, paint that? Well, no, no, <laughs> well I, I don't know. You don't. But I mean, but again, it's like the but that's kind of the cool part about yeah. it is that it's your enigma wrapped up in a mystery. Yeah. Like that's everything. Like <laughs> who would have thought, you know, the little the, old Dana. Yeah, little yeah. old Dana does a baby back rib painting. But like when somebody were you shocked of the that the per who when you met the person that they bought it? Were you un did you not expect that type of person to buy that yeah, painting? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say she was a type. I mean she's just another mm-hmm. you know just another woman yeah yeah a nice woman she was very friendly although it was hard to get to know her as much it was at the height of covid that she bought it oh, yeah. so it was all like oh i'll meet you outside and with close to drug Jesus. it's almost on it on the same space as God. probably drug dealing yeah it was yeah, like no, just yeah like just the, that covert to, yep and yeah. you have the stupid masks on your face <laughs> like i don't know what you're saying i yep. think you're smiling are you happy right yeah. now do you like my pain yeah yeah gotcha so, um there's a rabbit hole you want to go down but, uh, um, well yeah that <laughs> we could do that off, okay. off off recording but um so the gallery show yeah. so so how do those so you know how do those work do you get again hopefully not through matt mm-hmm. but you do do they come to you directly how those does that I, those process i can say those were on my own nice yeah, the, the museums, so how do they yeah. work the gallery so sometimes it's local you hear about it call for entries back in the day list serves and um it, postings like where did we even i don't remember there used to be listservs and places you could go and see calls for entries or seek them out or the back of was like art news magazine or something um you could go that way or sometimes you just hear about it or someone knows you're a painter and they like hey did you hear about this so 
a lot of word of mouth, but there was also official places to look. Um, and then you applied online, you sent or sent in slides in the early days. Mm. Those were the days, right? That was so much more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and then it thankfully got more digital and you could send JPEGs. That was a lot easier. Um, yes, yeah, so it was very much see, having your ear to the ground and looking for shows or even contacting if you, uh, we'd travel places and you'd see a gallery and maybe cold call them, just say, hey, you know, I'd like to have a show with you and show them your work. And then the more you do, the more you get. So the more you're out there, the more you hear, the more people know you, the more they'll come back to you and tell you about opportunities. So it's very, very progressive, very or symbiotic, like one thing leads to another, as with many things. Mm -hmm. Now, were they your, so were they just all of your paintings or did you do both where maybe you and a couple of artists were oh, featured? Yeah, both. Yeah. Okay. So my first solo show Yeah, so here let's in get DC, into that. Yeah, yeah. I, okay. So I was newly full-time and I was like, all right, let's do this. And approached a gallery I saw in Eastern Market in DC on Capitol Hill. And I think she, she had a call. Yeah, she had a call for art. And I remember went, going in and talking to her and she had planned on having it be a group show. And me and all of my confidence and go get it like let's do this i said yeah don't have a group show just do it all me I'll, it won't it be so much easier for you if you just had a solo show you don't have to deal with all these other people just give me the whole show and she said okay and so my so first solo show was supposed to be part of a group show but i said just give it to me how was that give feeling me. it was awesome and like that just gave me that was a great start like all right i can do this mm -hmm. and i did was it so do you work with the pr that you said it was a woman that yeah, that yeah. had okay did you work with her on sort of what paintings you wanted to have or did you get to decide okay I'm, these are what I'm going to give you this is you know how do you you know because usually there's sort of a process mm -hmm. where you put certain paintings certain places right so explain that whole entire process because that this is the this is where we're getting into the fun stuff for okay. me because this is where the stuff that i've always how it wanted. works okay. yes <laughs> so so how does it work like is it hard is it difficult is it easy are you fighting with the stu the the place that's putting it on you know, do you argue about how long you want to do it? Like, how does it work? So explain it. Give it's me, a yes and no on it's... every single one of those questions. Okay. It just depends on the show. So okay. this one was a space. I measured it. I created 100% of the work for the show. I created for the show. Okay. So I measured the space and me, again, back to like organized, uh, belt and suspenders sort of girl. You measure measure twice <laughs> you cut once right yep. um so you measure the space and i planned very carefully how many paintings i needed how big they would be and created that much work specifically for that space oh so you did not ha you you i did didn't have anything uh, i mean i was not even i was like and i have how much time to get this done all right i can do that so i i had a i landed a show i had no paintings and i created them for the show nice did you, like, was it, did the person that was putting on the show, did you ever have sort of a, did they say, well, I don't like that, I don't think this one should be in it? You or know, they had sort she of... said that, it wouldn't have landed well with me. Got that's, it. You know, I, and that's where every gallery is different, mm -hmm. but, um, and why it's infuriating. It's like, no, I, I created this. Are you, and where it comes, not freedom of speech, but you know, freedom of paint. Uh, if you're going to give someone a show and then say, I mean, if they're a curator, it's a, Got such a can of worms of an answer. If they're curating the show, then they're curating it. Then they have a say, right? Um, this was not that type of show. Okay. Um, I don't remember any any strife, any like, oh, I don't like this one or don't hang this one. I had free reign. It was a it was a great show in that sense. It didn't end as well. Like there's always like, oh, this is so perfect. But when it came time to take down the show, it was a little hairy. It was a little like she wasn't there anyway mm. there's no reason to get into that it was a 99 percent positive thing yep. if not a hundred percent and that happened to have a hiccup so no complaints there um but then other shows that are group shows it's sometimes you present them the one painting or two paintings if it's in a group show that you want to submit and they say yes or no um and with so much since i have so much work it would be impossible for me to tell i usually ask like is there something you particularly like or tell me your five favorites or something like that mm -hmm. since my art's all over the place on style if they like cubism they're not going to be happy if i give them a you know full-on realistic piece and so on um so yeah every show is different but the first one was i had a space i filled it and 
you know, I, I wrote all the rules. Nice. Is the intent... Just the way I like it. <laughs> exactly. Um, and it should be. It's uh-huh. your art. Like, you should have the right to make that decision. I mean, now, again, like you said, with the curated ones, you mm-hmm. kind of have that. But was the in, is your intention to do these to sell the art or yes. is your intention just to sort of show uh, your art it is to sell the art okay a gallery show and that's their intention they're really they're in it for the money gallery owners own galleries because they love art you hope right but it's their business mm-hmm. if if you don't sell anything none of us make any money and they're paying the rent mm-hmm. i'm paying my rent that's all all is fair um but galleries often typically take 50% it's it's a huge hit, mm-hmm. and maybe that's why some artists do charge some more money. They're looking to make. If you want to make five hundred dollars, you have to charge a thousand. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't believe in that. Yeah. You shouldn't pay a thousand dollars so I could make five hundred. Mm-hmm. And why is this other person getting five hundred dollars? Like, what have you done for me? So if the gallery isn't working for you, why are you giving them fifty percent? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's another can of worms to dive into. Yep. Um, are the cure? Do you like? The curated shows, are the curated shows easier or are the sort of independent where you get to decide easier? Okay, if it hasn't become clear yet that I'm a control freak, (laughs) I'm a control freak. So, no, it's all about me having control Mm -hmm. of what I want to hang and why I want to hang it and, you know, what I've put together. Mm -hmm. Um, Are there good curators? Are there bad curators? Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And those good curators. and And if it's curating on a theme, at least top of my mind, if you were to say shows... A curated show to, I mean, a, a gallery show to my mind, I've always submitted the paint. I'm, I'm giving you this painting as my submission. It's not for them to come and find one. That's what I was going to yeah, ask. Like so you... it's, I'm choosing what okay. I'm presenting. Yeah. Got it. They don't get to pick. Unless you give them five and they of course. pick from that. Right. Got it. Yeah. Okay. But then the gallery show, no, the non-curated ones, mm-hmm. you can kind of just basically say, okay, this is what I'm going to give you. Display what I give you. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. And oftentimes it's been, and I don't know what's common, common in my experience over all the years for all the shows I've had and Matt's because for all the years we've been together, we help each other hang each other's shows. So mm-hmm. in my experience in both my shows and his shows, we have wound up even hanging the shows. Mm-hmm. So it's not like here's a bunch of paintings put together the show for me it's like they're really just supplying the space got it um, um yeah so I, I even curated like i would the couple of shows that come to mind if any that i handed over art and then showed up for an opening and saw how they hung it yeah few and far between were you did you were you happy it's like were they were you okay with it or do you still tell them like do you still give them an idea of like this is what you should do with it like because i would i mean i yeah. can't think of an example but yeah that would be mm-hmm. me gotcha. i would i would be sticking my foot in yeah because it's you know it's my stuff mm-hmm. and i know how i wanted to present it do you still get excited when you're asked to do a gallery show or is it just sort of now it's like oh well i've done enough i kind of know how it works do you still get excited (laughs) like do you still get giddy that somebody wants to show you or is it sort of like now you've done so many that it's just like second nature for you it's a little bit of each i mean to be asked anything it's it's nice to be wanted right Mm -hmm. um but then the realistic part comes around you're like do i really want to do this like because i know too much i'm sure there's still good experiences to be had i wouldn't tell anyone you know don't ask i mean please ask and let's vet out the details and see if it is something i want to do and that's Mm -hmm. that's where i am now like yeah do you do you like doing them do you want to do them it depends on which one okay and now have such a clear view of I know what to ask. Um, mm-hmm. It used to be I'll, I would take anything because you have to get out there. And now it's good to be in a place that you can be selective. And it's very, very good to be in a place that you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know the pitfalls. You know the questions to ask so you don't wind up falling in the same holes. Yeah. Yep. Um, is there any – what – let's just – we'll kind of – is there any place that you would have – in D.C. or somewhere where you would love to have a painting? Yeah, the National Gallery of Art. Of no, the Women's <laughs> Museum. Let's start there. Yeah. Um, since, you know, everyone's so about identity, mm-hmm. right? So, yeah, yeah I'm, uh, hey, I'm a woman. Mm-hmm. Let's start there. Like, yeah. we're looking for women artists. Here, here I am. Mm-hmm. Um, I've painted more than, not more than anyone. I always have to qualify it when I write up descriptions, even like an Instagram and the little meta tags and stuff. I say the most prolific and successful female artist in D.C. Nice. Because I'm not the most prolific artist in D.C., that's Matt. Hands mm-hmm. down, no one else is. Mm-hmm. But... I beg anyone to tell me I'm not the most prolific female artist, maybe even the most prolific female artist living. Mm-hmm. I mean, 
I would love to know what other artists out there are doing what. I haven't seen them. I don't even know where to look. Um, but I believe I'm probably the most prolific female living painter right now. Nice. Wow. That's now now this podcast is way more, this podcast gets (laughs) way more serious and like, yeah, this paint, this podcast got way sort of, now it's going to go national. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Um, You know what? Heck, if I, I probably am wrong, right. I can say that because I don't know in my knowledge, mm -hmm. um, I believe that's true because I haven't seen otherwise. And I have, I, like I said, I fairly have tried to who's doing what, and when I look at other artists who's out there that you can find that are being talked about, those are in that other realm. Those are the gallery artists. Those are the ones that charge ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars and they're well known. So they might be, what does success mean? For me, success means how much art I'm creating, what I'm saying with it, and not that. I don't have a studio full of art. I create a lot of art and there's like a handful of paintings here. Mm-hmm. So success to me is painting a lot and selling almost all of them Mm -hmm. are all galleries museums sort of places to display your art are they the same or is there sort of a difference or do you look at certain places where art is being displayed as more you're more important if you're there or is it for you just the fact that you have someone can come and look at your painting like, is there sort of a, you know, if you're like Mart's at, you know, Matt's at the Visionary Museum, mm-hmm. you know, um, you've had galleries, you know, you're, you've been asked to be put in museums and stuff like that. Is there a, you know, if someone were to ask you to do a gallery show or if like the Hirschhorn, which is around mm-hmm. here, which to me is kind of a really underrated no, that's museum. museum. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, what I'm saying yeah. is, is that, you know, the National Gallery is a little bit different than the Hirschhorn or like a museum in, say, you know, Cleveland or something like that. Is there, like, do you view sort of galleries or the, where you display your art? Do you view it as a higher, is there a hierarchy to it? Are you just happy that a place is willing to show your art? Um, well, to me, so you, I I feel like you just said that the National Gallery and the Hirschhorn are different than the Cleveland Museum, which I... Or is there, do you not view that? That's my question. To me, museum is a museum. Like if you're a museum, if you're a museum, like Mm -hmm. a, a, well, National Gallery, the word gallery in there. So Mm -hmm. you you could say National Gallery is a gallery. Well, National Gallery is a museum. Um, So I would put any museum on, not the same stature, of course, there's tiny little museums Mm -hmm. but it's a museum so to me like just the title museum is a strata all of its own and then to me that's the title of a museum and then galleries are storefronts so that's a very different thing Mm -hmm. so and i'd take any museum show i wouldn't argue with any museum show but would i take any gallery show no okay no 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 those are a thousand gradients of answer gotcha okay that was my what is a gallery your living room is a gallery. True, yes. Um, yeah. Do I want to slap my stuff to your house in Pittsburgh? No, I, I mean, thank you. But I mean, it would be really um, cool. It's lovely. But yeah, it would be fun. And your buddies but, come over and we drink beer. I mean, it will be super fun. Yeah. But, but uh, gotcha. do I need to? Because that's the last thing I turned down was a house in D.C. Great guys. I mean, they're awesome. We showed with them before. Mm-hmm. And they have what they call like little gal or galleria. And, but it is. It's a one-night thing. And it's, it's fun. And it was fun when we did it. Do I need to do that now? No. Gotcha. Um, a gallery with like shiny white walls uh, asks me in New York City. It's not just a hands down yes because it's New York and it's a white walls gallery. It's still like, all right, do you take 50%? Will you pay for transportation? There's a lot of questions. Like I said, there's a lot of vetting to be done. But yeah, I want to be asked. I mm-hmm. want to be asked. I want to be, you want to be loved. <laughs> you want to be wanted. And then you can decide what to do with it. Do you still get excited selling a painting? Oh, God, yeah. Every painting. I'm thankful for every painting sale. Like, equally excited, whether it's a $40 thing or a $400 thing. For, you know, I don't have anything. I've never sold anything for 4000 mm-hmm. Probably the most expensive thing I've ever sold is $1,000. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, every every single sale, I'm just thrilled someone wants it. Mm-hmm. Like, doing something right. And it's, it's one person. It's super fun. Like, I did four paintings the other day, like, small works. And sold all four of them the same day. And one of them, three people wanted. Like, that is the pinnacle of success. That's the pinnacle of happy. Mm-hmm. How do you decide who to sell it to? The first person who oh, asks. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Now, yeah. I'm very fair on that. Yep. 
first person, the first note I get, if they came in at exactly the same time, like, I don't know, I'd have to come up with something. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, it's it's first person. Mm -hmm. Um, not to drop names, but have you ever had someone that sort of anyone or a famous person, has anybody famous ever purchased your painting or yeah, purchased so a painting? Yeah, the most recent, um, Paul Wesley, mm -hmm. an actor on one of those, uh, I'm terrible, like I should know what he does. Um, those who were listening who knew Paul Wesley are like, oh my God. Okay. He's like a vampire TV show, but a show I didn't watch because it's I'm a little too old. Old, I think I shouldn't be watching this. Mm -hmm. um, and he also has a bourbon line now, so that was cool. And he, he came through the vegan community is how he found me. Um, he actually commissioned me to do a painting with his dog in it. Oh, nice. So that's neat. And his dog is famous, too. His dog even has an Instagram. Oh, wow. <laughs> nice. Um, trying to think who else. A couple of... Um, oh, one... Oh, I should, no, I won't tell this story. No, oh, I, I just sounded like Joe Biden there. I'm just cutting <laughs> myself off. Like, nope, 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 nope. I'm not allowed to say that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, but is it, does it, does the fact that maybe that person is famous, do you get starstruck that someone famous bought your painting or do you not, you know, like if I came in and bought your painting, would it, are you indifferent to who buys your paintings? I'm equally happy on one front. I really, it's honestly like I create things not for vanity. I don't create them because, I mean, I create them because I want to, and that's the only way it's good is if I want to paint it, mm -hmm. um, you know, I've taken on commissions and it's another thing I've learned over the years. Like the answer is not just, yes, do you take commissions? The answer is like, I'll decide if I take your commission because some of them just suck out your soul. Like if it's something I don't want to be painting, it won't be good. Mm -hmm. Um, so every painting I make, I make because I want it to be good enough that it speaks to someone in some way. So every sale is equally happy. If it's a star, like that's kind of neat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It does make it a little better. I mean, they're not better people or bigger, whatever. It's still just as happy of a sale, but it could lead to something. So as a businesswoman, it's a little better because you never know what might come of it. Mm -hmm. Have you, you ever see it? Right? Yeah. Have you ever refused to sell a painting to someone? Hmm. Let's think. Not off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. I may have, let's say, I did just say the first person that wanted to buy something is the one that gets it. But, um, if I ever had to make a judgment call mm -hmm. on which person to sell it to. Well, not just that, but like maybe that they, you felt they didn't, they wouldn't appreciate as much or you maybe didn't want to sell it or, you know, you're like, well, I don't, I, I'm getting bad vibes from this person. Like, I'm not sure if I want, like, cause I, I can't think of a time that that's come up, but the conversations come up. Cause when I've done these vegan veg paintings of animals, it's, we've joked around over the years, like, you know, what would happen if, you know, McDonald's comes to you and says, I want to, or someone buys it and want, uh, people aren't allowed to use them in a campaign. I mean, I hold yeah. the copyright, so that yep. can't happen, although it does happen and then you can sue them. Um, but yeah, that it does become the scruples question is the only time I could think I would face that. Mm -hmm. Not a, do I like this person or, cause I have, and I can say this safely cause people don't know who they are that I'm about to talk about. I have definitely sold a number, a large number of paintings to people who interpret it one way and I meant another, mm -hmm. but that's, but that's art. Mm -hmm. I, it's not, that's not a bad thing or a wrong thing. It's me. It's a nice interior, like internal giggle I can have. Like, mm -hmm. and now there's all these people, whoever's listening to this, like, am I one oh. of those people? What does this mean? What mm -hmm. have I done? What, yeah, my, yeah, what is this my... thing hanging on my wall? And what yep. did she mean by that? But definitely that happens. Mm -hmm. Um, so kind of going into your process, um, when you, how do you start a painting? How, how <laughs> does it start? So, so do you, do you have an idea of what you're going to paint or do you just basically put the can, the canvas or the medium that you're going to paint on and you say, okay, whatever, do you stand there and stare at it for 20 minutes or do you have an idea of what you're painting? Let's for time number five, Dana Ellen is a control freak. <laughs> yes. I do not stand in front of a blank canvas and, and not no it's everything's planned everything's planned that kind of takes a little bit of the fun out of this answer doesn't it i'm a planner i plan i might take two days to come up with a painting before i even put pencil to sketch pad forget about pencil to canvas uh there's a lot of thought not for every bird and uh i do a lot of fun paintings just about drinking and whatnot that's those are fun mm -hmm. but they still have plans i still have to come up with what they look like and what kind of style I might, well, the style I don't plan, that happens. That's your style. That, that happens, like which mm -hmm. style is going to come out, whether it's tighter or looser. Um, 
But no, there's always planning. And it might be a book I'm reading. It might be me purposely researching something or having a nugget of an idea saying I heard. Um, I was I loved the Good Place TV show. I, I watch shows and movies and stuff while I paint. So I went and watched through The Good Place and during that show wrote a lot of little notes and it got me into reading about existentialism. So you just don't know what thread is going to get pulled and where it's going to go. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting here as we're talking. I have a painting of John Paul Sartre like staring at me the whole time with his big googly eyes. Like that came out of The Good Place of all things, like a silly was NBC TV show, mm -hmm. which led me to learning about existentialism, which led me to doing that painting. Oh, nice. So you, they come from everywhere, but yeah. there's always a reason. Do you ever... Does it ever get to a point where you get to a point where you're like, okay, I don't know where to go next? Or do you, do you, or basically, do you finish all of your paintings? Uh, eventually. I, uh, I used to okay. be 100% linear. Um, up until the past couple of few years, the answer was, yeah, they have a beginning, middle, and end. And that's how I worked. I came up with an idea, step one, maybe sketched first, but it's usually not on paper, usually right onto the canvas. And then I sat and I painted it until it was done. And it was done because it was very clear it was done and it got posted and it sold and end of story. But the past few years, I'm very pleased with my process having changed and altered. Like I finally feel that time. And even, even though I've been full time for so long, I'm in a new place now in the past few years that I really have the time. Like I'm just relaxed into it. So now I have a bunch of stuff underway and even stuff I thought was finished if it didn't sell, perhaps that means it's not finished. So mm -hmm. uh, some stuff cycles in and out of my studio until it hits that sweet spot and until it sells. Some stuff I won't paint over because I'm like, no, this is important or this I, I com I'm committed. I know this is good. It just hasn't found its person. Do you have any unfinished paintings? Right now? Yeah, a couple. OK. But yeah, a couple are officially like unfinished. And then there's a bunch that are still like on on tap that might get re-hit okay so yeah. you do have ones that you just you like what is that feeling or do you know do you know when you kind of can't go any farther like again you have a like you said you have some paint or how you know what's your oldest painting that's unfinished oh in that sense there i don't really have too many things like that like okay there may be a couple things sitting around but i don't think of them as i don't know i never think of that what's sitting around unfinished because that would plague me mm -hmm. because I like everything to be tied up and I like beginnings and ends. I don't, I can't, I don't even do well if there's, if I'm waiting for an answer on something and I don't have it, I can't move forward. Mm -hmm. So I don't do, now you're going to like, now this is going to probably be like a problem now. I'm like, Oh, this stuff's unfinished. This is a problem. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I don't think of them as unfinished. I just think of them as works in progress or stuff. They're, they're things I haven't, figured out yet so there's mm -hmm. a lot of paint on a lot of canvas um and again this is the first time in my art career that i've been like that but i'm enjoying it because i can rifle through them and then one day all of a sudden it'll hit me like oh i get what this is going to be now oh okay because yeah. i was going to say do they do the unfinished works sort of you know to p play on word do they haunt you oh because... they will now <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh man i just brought i, I don't want to be the one that causes you to just have all this no 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 i understand <laughs> yep um so, so you've been doing this for a long time. Give me how, how many, how many exhibits have you done? How many, like, I mean, is it, like I said, it, it's just fascinating to me, but, and kind of go back. I mean, you know, you've become very, like you said, you're one of probably the most prolific female artists yeah, in let's, let's DC. Keep, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, how many, how many shows have you done? How many, like, give me, you know. Are you proud of, is it, is it the number that you're proud of or the, the actual show itself or the shows itself, you know? Um, I guess all those things. I, I never thought to count the shows. I've thought about counting up the paintings, um, which is countless thousands upon thousands, like 10,000. I don't, I, I really need to go through and count. Um, shows in the heyday of shows. So like 20 to 15 to 10 years, like a 10 year span, but 10 years ago, there were a lot of shows. Mm. Um, and there were times where I'd have four solo shows in a year or, and a couple of group shows. So if I averaged five shows a year for 10 years, give or take, that might be a starting point, but I'd, I've never really thought to quantify, mm -hmm. um, how many shows. Yeah. I just know there were a lot back in the 10 to f 10 to 20 years ago and then dwindling pretty quickly from there by choice. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, I gotcha. 
Um, so now I just want to go over it. So we kind of like we're talking about it. I kind of I didn't mean to kind of sidetrack you there, but um, but I want to get more into sort of your art style and your sort of your state as an artist. So I'm going to kind of I, I called these when I was writing up these questions. I was thinking like these are the rapid fire questions that I'm going <laughs> to ask. Some, Dana. Oh, so, go ahead. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so these are kind of the. These are the questions that I've always had about, and you've answered some, and, and but these are going to be the rapid. Okay. Okay. So, are you very particular about the paint that you use? Yes. Okay. So you can't like if one type of paint, or now are you specifically oil based? Do you use like so? What is your what is your medium? There are probably more acrylic paintings in my portfolio than oil, but that's partly due to the nature that acrylic dries quickly. So when you want to get something done, you do it in acrylic. And okay. oil has traditionally been where I turn to when I want to do more realistic, like fine classical style. But thankfully, as with all things, I've loosened that up over the years. Now I, quote unquote, know how to paint loosely with oil. Okay. Um, so, so what would you say? You're, you're, do you do more acrylic? or? Yeah, yeah. There's definitely okay. more acrylic paintings out there. But I've done now over the past few years that that balance has has swayed a bit and it's tilting more toward oil okay. more often and the do i have a favorite paint yeah, acrylic was... versus oil i can't say which one's a favorite because they're very different gotcha um as far as paint brand yeah that's I what's insane favorite yeah paint brand is utrecht paint okay hands down so if like a different no one if a different one's on sale you won't oh no but okay. there are piles of other paint brands all in my studio there's buckets of different kinds of paint because just like everything else, there's a time and a place. So mm -hmm. I start a painting using the cheap stuff, the non track. Like I have tons of paint that is just for other different purposes. Um, they give you different paintings when you use different paints. So to use one type of paint, you come out not with one type of painting, but a consistency, which maybe that's where my lack is. <laughs> my lack of consistency is too many supplies. Um, so yeah, there's, there's the best paint but it's by far not the only paint because you need all of them. Gotcha. Yeah. Are you particular about what you paint on? So are you, mm. you know, do you predominantly choose canvas? Do you use like what, you know, are you particular about the medium that you paint on? Uh, it depends on the Dana that day. So there's there's days for cardboard. There's days for paper. There's days for canvas. There's it books. I books, saw books. Books. Yep. Um, menus. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so not anything I can get my hands on because I don't want to be too, like, kitschy mm -hmm. and crafty. Um, but, yeah, books are probably the craftiest, like, kind of kitsch that mm -hmm. I do. But other than that, it's it's 90% canvas and um, or 90, yeah, 80% canvas and then paper, mm -hmm. paper cardboard. Gotcha. Yep. Um, is the first brush stroke the hardest or the last brush stroke the hardest or the last thing that you do on the painting the hardest? I don't think I could say either one was the hardest. The first, it's certainly not the first one because I don't, I'm not someone who stands in front of a white canvas like a tortured artist going, what is it going to be? I already know, at least I have a plan. It might completely stray. It might turn in, and often does, turn into a totally different thing than I started with. But the first stroke is certainly not hard. Mm -hmm. um, and the last one isn't either. No, I don't. I wouldn't use hard to describe it. Hard is, no, nah, I don't think it's hard. I mean, mm -hmm. art is not easy, not by any means. I think people who think it's easy are gravely mistaken and something we talk about a lot. Um, it's not just something you just sit down and make. It takes a lot to get there. Mm -hmm. So it's it's hard in that sense. It's a trial, but I wouldn't say the first or last stroke is hard by any yeah. means. Do you do you know when you're done or could you literally take a painting and just keep sort of doing things to it like how do you know when to say okay dana i'm done like stop it stop. depends yeah the realistic ones are done when they're done they're done when i put the last dot um you know in the polka dot shirt the woman's wearing then it's done and then <laughs> too many times i have thought it was done posted it and until i see it on my screen do i realize i forgot like a hand or something mm -hmm. but no the realistic ones are linear they have a they have an end i'm done when i have finished all like making everything look quote unquote right that's easy those are done when they're done but the more expressive ones are done when they feel done there's and and those are the ones i might go back and certainly wake up in the morning with fresh eyes and there's a part that just doesn't sit well mm -hmm. but you still i still know when they're done yeah how that's the, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the eternal question yes yeah especially for that's and that's and and not to kind of but it to me that's 
the biggest question for Pollock. Yeah. Like, yeah, that was that do, was in the movie yeah, too. <laughs> that's what I mean. How do I? How do you know when you're done? Yeah, and he had some wise ass answer to that. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, What's Dana's wise ass answer my, to it? <laughs> mine is well, depend. The realistic ones are done when they're they're very clearly done when they're done mm-hmm. because I have finished executing them, um, and then. The ones that are not realistic are done when nothing bugs me about them anymore. Oh, uh, okay. That's a, that's that's a, that's a good pretty question. good answer. Yeah, yeah. That's a great answer. And when they stop bugging me, like mm-hmm. when I can turn around and sneak up on them and there's not a little part going, me, like making mm-hmm. a little noise. It's like bothersome little part that still needs to be hit. And then inevitably you'll hit it and be like, oh, I screwed that up. And then you need to do it like until you stop screwing it up. Mm-hmm. Have you ever wanted to change your style or, or did you say, I'm going to change my style, but did it ever come to it where maybe you hesitated because you were afraid that maybe the people that like your artwork might not like, let's say all of a sudden you started drawing like people, you know, uh, eating hamburgers and having <laughs> fun and, and sort of, but just cause you, yeah. now you say you're, you've gone sort of that, like the baby back ribs instead of the baby back ribs, maybe like the, you know, the person eating the, the, the baby. Oh, I've ha- done that too though. Yeah. yeah. But, <laughs> but, um, so have you ever, decided or have you ever thought i want to change my style or i'm i, I want to kind of change i i'm kind of i like what i'm doing but i want to try something different but and did you do it or did you sort of based on the fact that people expect mm. sort of your style this is the other question that i have like is it hard to change because you know that you peep you might not sell Right. the paintings if you change well i have changed and like i've said there's so many different styles that live within me that i think i've kept people guessing enough that it's almost the opposite for me i feel i've uh, this cubism that i i started doing just earlier this year came out of literally nowhere so yeah i consciously am always trying to loosen up it's always been my goal for all these years of painting full time and that has manifested in different ways um and when i said you know i'm gonna I'm just going to try to break these shapes apart and just force myself to abstract this scene. And it came out cubist. I was as surprised as the next person. I was surprised as all of my you know, audience and collectors who were like, where'd this come from? I never even liked cubism. So that was a, a risk, but I never, I didn't hesitate for a second, never crossed my mind. Don't do this because they might not like it. I painted it because it's what came out and people liked it, which was great. And had I done five of them and none sold, would I have strayed away from it? Yeah, I probably would have not gone too deep down that path. But it was accepted well, and people are enjoying them, and I'll continue experimenting with it. Yeah. As a style, it's more subject matter that I don't Mm. do because I'm afraid of, not afraid, hate that word. I've hesitated to say things with my art with my audience and collectors in mind Mm -hmm. and that's hugely frustrating i bet hugely frustrating Mm -hmm. um but it's the world we live in which is a shame because it's like i mean probably back you know 1800 1750 you know people painted stuff that was controversial and now it's praised and back then they were like shun him that shun them that was and but it's like and now it's yeah i mean i've painted tons of controversial stuff it's been Mm -hmm. it's actually my mo it's it's where i only have a name in the in the art world not only but i i credit a huge part of the reason i am where i am today is because of the controversy that i've painted politically religiously the veganism the veganism probably had the biggest launching point as far as broadening my audience it's all controversy that got me here it's just the world is a little more precarious now it's a little bit riskier a little bit a lot of it Mm -hmm. (laughs) riskier to be controversial now yeah um do you still enjoy painting or just like with anything it's a job like do you do you is it i mean you need to make a living painting Mm -hmm. so do you still get excited for every painting or is it, do you feel at a certain point you have to paint, uh, you're forcing yourself to paint because you need to sell it in order to like, in order to support yourself because yeah. you're a full-time artist. So yeah. does it, does it still get, does every single painting still excite you or do you at a certain point you're just like, Oh, I've got to paint today cause I haven't painted in and I've got to sell painting. So how does that, you know, do you still get excited to paint? Yeah. Excuse me. Okay. I, um, I never, I'm not excited to paint. Like I would never go, I don't want to go to work today. I don't want to paint. I always want to paint. I'm not, I mean, there's, we take days off. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't ever not want to paint. Um, the thing that gets me less excited is having to paint a certain thing. So like I said, the commission 
that might be a day I'm like, I don't want to paint this, but I never don't want to paint. So if I'm painting for money, because you do have to pay the bills, that is what we do full time. Um, both Matt and I are doing this full time to pay all the bills. So yeah, we have to keep that in mind. Um, but I would much rather paint what I wanted. And I do have that freedom to do because thankfully, even what I want to paint sells, if I got in a matter of like, a bill coming due and I needed to make money, I know where I would, I know which direction I would take my paintings in those days or that time mm -hmm. to be a little bit more confident that they would sell. I wouldn't take as many risks. Mm -hmm. um, how do you deal with praise? So I, I like, like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you humble or do you, I mean, again, you're, you're, you know, do you, are you, are you humble where you're like, Oh, it's just, you know, how do you like, do you, do you welcome it? Is it a surprise when people praise you? Like, how does that? It never, just like your question about selling a painting, every painting is just as, makes me just as happy to sell. I don't think that ever, I hope that never wears off. That would be sad. Like, I take that much pleasure. And every time someone sincerely says something like, wow, even a wow on Facebook, like it's, it could be meaningless. Maybe we'll just be nice sometimes. But anyone who writes and says anything specifically to that painting or, or really engages with it, every single one of those conversations is important to me. And I, I engage back. Like if someone has connected, I ask them why. Um, what, you know, what is it about, what speaks to you on this piece? Or especially every person who buys a painting and it's a painting that deserves engaging over. It's not a burger or a woman drinking. Like I said, my sort of go-to stuff that obviously you like it because drinking's fun. I mean, that's why you're buying this. Mm. But if it's about something historical or about an author or about a, a political event or any anything of of note they they usually are the first to tell me i i won't just ask someone because it is none of my business um but if they are looking to engage i love it i'd mm -hmm. love to engage and have a conversation over why you're buying it and how it speaks to you and i've developed I, there's people who buy my work that i in my head i'm like oh that's my friend so and so i'm like i've never met them mm -hmm. but we've gotten to know each other oh, nice. um through conversations about my paintings that's great now, on the opposite side, mm -hmm. how do you deal with criticism? I'm used to that, too. Mm -hmm. So um, to the point of hate mail and death threats over the years. And it's people are bananas. Um, and criticism. So in the art festival days, mm -hmm. you have to be able to deal with it. So someone walking by and rolling their eyes or saying to their spouse, like, Ugh, you know, you actually see them like disgusted. You're like, wow, all right, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty good at laughing that off. Um, but, you you have. Oh, go, go ahead. Um, yeah. You have your, so you paint, you, your, your painting is your interpretation of your painting. Mm -hmm. Someone looks at your painting and maybe interprets it differently. Are you okay with that? Like, are you, or do you want your painting to be interpreted by everyone the way that you no, interpret it? No, absolutely not. No, it's really important. And that's what I've had to learn to be better at and good at for that purpose. Like, I don't want everyone to read into it what I meant. I, I want to learn to be ambiguous enough that people can bring in their own thing. And there's times where I've been better and worse at that. Like I said, the baby back ribs, there's really no two ways about it. That was just in your face. Mm -hmm. um, and my opinions are really strong about anything I have an opinion on, I'm behind it. Um, and I could stand up, I could go to a debate team on it. But with my painting, I really try i don't always succeed i try to put it out there in a way that leaves room for you to bring your own stuff into it's not just for me to profess and and you know proselytize over stuff gotcha do you uh do you get compared to other artists and if you do do you like that or do or does that make you kind of frustrated or how does that make you feel if you're being compared to other artists or do you like being compared to other artists well there's no getting around it so with my art history background i think is the reason for it or just as a great art appreciator i i do take i don't know what the right word i i use a lot of paintings from history and reinterpret them i find it fun so I open myself up. Yeah, you have to compare me because, yes, I did just use Picasso's, like, Salt and Beaks painting to do my painting about migration. It's right there. Like, I, there's no denying it. I'm not even trying to. Usually I'll even put it in the description. Like, before you go, oh, my God, that looks like a Picasso, I've already said I used Picasso's painting as my inspiration. So I get compared all the time because I use a lot of paintings from art history throughout history to, like, update them to 
my interpretation. Mm -hmm. So let's talk to the Dana in 30, 40, 50 years. Um, do you think your style changes? <laughs> yeah, I, I would think so. I mean, that's... Do you want it to? Do I want it to? Not in a sense of that I don't like where it is now. No, no, no. Right, but, but I, I do because I still think if you don't change, you're not growing. Mm -hmm. And so I continue to t just like learning things. It's I continue to take things in and I want to continue to develop my style, whatever that is, um, or all of my styles. Mm -hmm. And if they coalesce into some one thing, I mean, so many artists over time, when you see, I mean, if you look at, since you referenced Pollock, if you look at an early Pollock, he studied under Thomas Hart Benton, who's like the most brilliant, realistic muralist. So no artist, and I could be contradicted, I don't believe any artist in history that we know as abstract, Rothko, there's a, there's a Rothko exhibit at the National Gallery right now. I'm not a fan of Rothko. I will not sit at the Phillips Collection and ponder a Rothko. Can't do it. But I had no idea, even with my art history background, that his early work these brilliant little works on paper that I love. There's one room in the exhibit. I'm like, I could spend all day there and just skip the rest of it. Mm -hmm. um, so do I think I'm going to become a purely abstract artist in my later years? It might happen. It happens to a lot of artists, but am I trying to get there? No. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'm just going to I'll see where it takes me. Mm -hmm. So I'm a fan of your art, but whose art are you a fan of? So too many to answer. Like I've said, it's, mm -hmm. I don't have one direction and it depends on. Who was your first, who was the first, let's, we'll kind of, yeah. we'll kind of, we'll kind of, since start, there's so yeah. many, we'll start. So who is, who was your, who was all, who was your first? Who was your first? Who was my first? Who was your first? So personal. <laughs> um, I, really the cliche, just, you know, Manet, Monet, Renoir, like in my early pretty days. Mm -hmm. um, college, it became uh the more classic, like uh, David and Rembrandt and like the classicists. And then it became even names I can't pull from right now. So my my religious uh, studies came through art. So when I started learning in my art history classes, the figures and the paintings, I never knew anything about religion growing up. So I learned about religion through art history. So that became my favorite thing because I love the allegory and all this, all the story. And that's where all my story based love came from was religious paintings. They're all telling stories. Um, so then it became, you know, Titian. And then from there, fast forwarding a bit to the Matt years, the early Matt years, it was through him I was introduced to Basquiat. It was on our first date. He's like, I love the movie Basquiat. I was like, I've never heard, how am I, how did I study this and never heard of Basquiat? Mm -hmm. um, and then, went to folk art festivals with him. So then that was my favorite thing because those were so all about storytelling and all personal. So it just, it depends. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a favorite because I, I, I like, I like all of it. I like yeah. all of it for different reasons. Mm -hmm. Who, but there's stuff I dislike, yeah, of course. but my, <laughs> my likes cannot be put on a short list. Mm -hmm. um, if someone listening to this um, if you wanted to say promote another or another painter or artist, you know, someone that somebody doesn't know that you sort of the undiscovered artist or someone that you wish people would know more about or and again, it could be older, it could be newer. Hmm. Give me someone that that if if that maybe they're starting out or they're maybe not as well known as you are. Um, give them a little bit of prop. Who would who would you say to someone, hey, go check this person out? They're very sort of not well known, but they deserve to be more known. Yeah, I'm going to turn that around and say, I don't know who that is, but I'm looking for them. Mm -hmm. I would love to. Um, there's a big thing coming up in D.C., like an all comers art show that we're going to go to. And I'm I, I would love to go to the show and be like, wow, who's this young whippersnapper? Um, I don't know them. I I am not being selfish here. I honestly don't. I can't point you to who to look at. I'm looking for who to look at. Who's who's doing what right now? Mm -hmm. um, so I too would like to find them. So maybe someone else can answer that, and I will follow their lead. Gotcha. So I'm gonna have these are kind of the two that I want. I want kind of the last two that we'll get to. So the first question I have is, um, so what is art to you? Hmm. Let's see, it's all wound up, and now you're gonna bring me down to being philosophical. What is art to me? Art is life. Um, art is what I do. Art is what makes me happy. Um, art is what I know. 
I don't I don't have a, a giant answer for that. It is it's it's not all I know because I do like I've said I have so many interests and in reading and learning about things. But it, it's me. It's who I am. When I read, I read a ton of art artist biographies, and um, you know I'm not looking for myself in them. But I, I was saying recently that the artist biographies I've read recently, I'm happy I'm reading them at this age and not when I was younger because I would almost accuse myself of, oh, you just read that in a book and you're trying to model yourself that way. But reading them in my 50s going, wow, yeah, that I did that. I did that. I did that. Like it's back up for the path I've been on is um, I don't need it validated because I'm happy with it. But at the same time, reading artist biographies and reeling, realizing I I, they echo my feelings on things like women not having children is a big one. Um, and the, the choices I've made, the way I live, I'm like, hey, yes, I'm an artist. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, it's, it's great, like just fulfilling. That was going to be my next question. Do you consider yourself sort of the artist term, you know, is, is been handed down for centuries. Mm -hmm. Do you consider yourself an artist? Yeah, I do. But then the question is like, what do you mean by that? Yeah, what do you mean by what that? What do you mean? What by do you that? mean by that? <laughs> um, I mean by that I'm not living this. There are there are books on you know how to be a good parent. There's books on how to be a good lawyer. I'm sure, <laughs> I would imagine. You know what I mean? Like there's handbooks to stuff, and the choices I've made, the paths I've the path I've taken, and choices I've made, are not stuff you're gonna find in like normal how to do life successfully. Um, but they're choices that have made me happy and have been successful for me. Mm -hmm. So I just, so to end this, I just, I just want to say like, this has been amazing. Like oh. I had such a great time because I'll never be able to grasp what it's like to be you and what you do. But I, I definitely, some of that sort of the questions and sort of the, the longing that I've always wanted to know <laughs> about what you do has been answered. I mean, I don't think I'll ever... I'll never be able to get entirely what you do because of just how special it is and how how it takes an, an, a very sort of extraordinary or just sort of someone like you to do it. It takes a completely like I could never do what you do. And and the fact that you've opened up and you've kind of given me a glimpse of what you do is I can't thank you enough. Oh, I mean, well, this has you. been so amazing for like, someone to want to talk about it is tremendous because who's to TV show that used to be on called Wife Swap. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever oh, watched yeah, it. Oh, yeah, I think so, yeah. I thought that would be the only, that would be a huge step for someone to start to understand what we do and how we live. Mm -hmm. um, until you, until you try on the shoes and walk around in them, like I always say, it's just, you, for someone to want to ask the questions, huge appreciation for what you're doing here and mm -hmm. wanting to know about it because hopefully other people will learn because there's, there's no way someone to just look at the paintings or talk to us or have a drink with us, whatever, and be like, oh, I, I know those two, or I, I know you, or why you do your art. It, it There's a lot going on under the surface. So mm -hmm. thanks for start trying to scratch it. I, I hey, I, I, the, the, like I said, you, I'm interviewing Matt, you know, Matt's going to be on either mm -hmm. before or after, and, and both of you at the same time. The fact that you have both welcomed me to, to sort of ask you these questions and to do it, I can't tell you how much I'm honored to do it, because like I said, this... You know, I've interviewed my friends and those are people that sort of I've I've become friends with and stuff like that, where you were you're the first you and Matt will be the first sort of people that weren't my friends, but that I now or even though we've only met one mm -hmm. or two times before that I consider you my friend. So it's like, yeah. you know, it was nice to be it, it felt like I was sitting down with my friend. Good. That's so I hope feels. you felt the same. Absolutely. Way. Yeah. And we really like there's been so many times of saying. God, someone would just ask us, and you're doing it. You're asking us. So Excellent. That's great. Much to be said. Yeah. Awesome. So um, thank you so much, thank Dan. You. I appreciate it. And uh, I hope you have an awesome, wonderful, amazing rest of your day. Well, thanks. You too. Perfect. Thanks. Bye. All right, Dana. So if, if people wanted to view your art or find your art or purchase your art, purchase your <laughs> art, where can people go to find you? 
uh, you're going to go to my website, which is danaellen.com, and the spelling is D-A-N-A-E-L-L-Y-N.com. Okay. Do you have a, a Patreon? Um, do you ship your paintings? Uh, how would I go about purchasing one of your paintings? Uh, just send me an email. There's links on the site, like I'd like to purchase this, inquire. So um, you could do that through my site, and my email is just dana at danaellen.com also, if you just go at it straight. Um, shipping, yeah, I ship all over the world. Um, piece by piece, I just give people pricing on shipping. Sometimes it's free. Sometimes, you know, there's like deals to be had. Um, but yeah, shipping national, international. Uh, could people also potentially come and visit to pick up a piece here? Oh yeah, absolutely. So I'm in downtown DC, right in the heart of it. And um, yeah, it's great for people to come by. We used to do open studios, but we've stopped doing those partly because we don't have like a stable of paintings in the house. They're all sold, good problem to have. Um, but yeah, if people come to town and arrange, say I'm gonna be there, um, schedule a time and, a, and we can coordinate and have people up to the studio. Gotcha. Yeah. If people wanted to support you, do you have a Patreon or sort of anything like that? I do not have a Patreon. I've thought about it. Um, it might come about one day, but for now, it's just all just through paintings. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, Instagram, Facebook. Um, all those things. Yeah. Uh, and just Dana Ellen at Instagram and on Facebook. I think it's something a little clue you like Dana dot Dana Ellen. But if you search Dana Ellen, you will find me. I have both a personal and a fan page, but I pretty much echoing the same information on both right now. There's nothing specific to one or the other. Excellent. Um, any other, uh, are you sort of doing any, like you said, are you are you going to be showing anywhere or are you going to be anywhere where if someone wanted to come meet you or anything like that? Or, you know, like you said, you were mentioning that you're going to sort of an art thing that's going on in DC. Mm. Could someone, you know, are you, uh, do you welcome people coming up and saying hi? Oh gosh, yeah. If you if you see me out, if I'm that recognizable, that's pretty neat. Um, yeah, so certainly say hello, get in touch, say hello. Um, I don't have any gallery shows lined up at the moment. You never know what the future will bring. But for now, yeah, you just be in touch to um, arrange a time if you wanted to come see a painting at the studio. Um, it's socially uh, joked around about a couple of ideas, and it might be fun, like saying where matt and i might be for a happy hour and if someone wants to come by while we're out but we're much more um sort of seat of our pants on that like when we have something scheduled it drives us a little crazy so it tends to be a last minute um so yeah just Perfect. be in touch excellent i'm much better with plans than um impromptu gotcha yeah so the website pretty website, much yep. where to go don't don't just pop by no don't. <laughs> Please. Perfect. And what was the website again? Uh, DanaEllen.com. Perfect. And you can get uh, all your paintings are available there. Everything is there. It's chronological, starting with the most current on the first page. And then you can click back. I think I'm at like 230 pages on my website now. That'll bring you all the way back to the 90s. Perfect. And yep. you can buy the old paintings too? Uh, if you can find any for sale. Excellent. <laughs> Thanks, Dana. Yeah, thank Appreciate you it. so all much. Right. All right. See bye. Ya. Thanks for checking out this episode of The Extraordinary Ordinary Interview. If you enjoyed the episode, you can rate and review the episode on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can also get in touch with the podcast on Instagram at Yappy Chatterbox Podcast or email at Yappy Chatterbox Podcast at gmail.com. Have a wonderful, awesome, amazing rest of the day, and thanks for listening.